someone to assist them to resolve it. Now, that can come from an ex the, the assistance comes from an external source, and it can be an independent arbitrator, a mediator, or a judge in the high court. Now, one of the, one of the problems as I see it, is that the approach to dispute resolution and litigation in particular by practitioners is all wrong. They start with a matter doing things incorrectly and then sort of panel beat the thing as they get, get along and eventually they get to a trial date. Now we know what happens on trial date the matter never goes to court. It gets postponed. It even gets struck off the roll. Um, why does that happen? Um, or it gets settled at the doors of the court. And I'll show you later that door settlements are no longer accepted. So what I'm going to say to you is that you have to change your mindset. The 21st century deals with dispute resolution very differently. And as an attorney or as an advocate, if you don't change the way uh, you practice, you are going to become irrelevant. You'll become irrelevant to your client and you will not survive in practice. Now, just get one thing straight. The work that we as lawyers have traditionally um, uh, had uh, we that we traditionally did on our own, uh, where we reserved the work for ourselves, uh, has disappeared. Uh, lawyers now have to compete with other professions, such as accountants, uh, bookkeepers, uh, consultants. Uh, various um, uh, organizations dealing with anything from wills and estates to property to corporate work. Um, and of course, our biggest um, uh, competitor is the internet. So, but there's one area of law where lawyers are still necessary, we are relevant, and we can do the work better than anyone. Uh, that is because we have the skills. And that is dispute resolution where it is necessary to get a judge to intervene. In other words, going to court. Not everyone can, can go to court. A, a partner from Deloitte is not going to be able to represent their clients in court unless that partner is a is, is an admitted legal practitioner. Well, how do you be how do you keep relevant in in dispute resolution? I'll tell you there's only one way. And that is when your client comes to you with a problem. You must be focused on the client and the and the substance of the issue. What you want to do as a legal practitioner, whether you're a law firm or a practicing advocate, doesn't matter. Clients come to you with a problem. Your job is to resolve the dispute quickly and cheaply. Now, we got ourselves a really bad name as lawyers because litigation if you look at what happened over the last 10 years, litigation has become impossible. It's something for the rich people. And even the rich people get frustrated by it because it took too long and it cost too much money. And the reason that happened, it's got nothing to do with the system. You know, you hear stories about, ah, oh, the courts are a mess, the registrar's office don't know what they're doing. Uh, you can't get a date, and the roles are too full, and so on. Well, that's not the reason why cases took too long, and um, 
and uh, cost too much money. Uh, Betty, I'm seeing that one person says they can't hear me. Um, am I audible enough? Yes, you are. Maybe okay. that person must just lock out and in again or use okay. earphones. All right. OK. So. The, the, there's only one way that you can become very effective as a uh, in a dispute resolution practice. And that is to litigate the correct way. Now, internationally, we had this problem where cases in court took too long and cost too much money. So what, why? What is the reason? The reason is simple. It's got nothing to do with the system. It's got everything to do with the practitioners. It's the lawyers who are the problem. So how did, how, how did we resolve this problem? Or how do we resolve it? Well, the start of the whole transformation of the, of the lawyers' practices happened in 1990, as far back as 1990, when in England they started um, a commission of inquiry into why the civil justice system was not serving its purpose. Because once it takes too long and costs too much money, it doesn't serve a purpose. Okay? And, and that should never be the case. They appointed a, um, a judge, a, one of the law lords, Lord Wolfe, and he conducted a commission of inquiry um, wherein the profession participated, advocates and attorneys, and came up with a report that showed very, very clearly that the cause of the trouble was the way the lawyers handled their cases. And this series of webinars that I'm going to give you will help you to become far more effective as litigating lawyers. You will finish matters quicker. And let me get the elephant out of the room, OK? I get asked this question all the time. Well, if we don't run our cases, if we finish cases too quickly, we won't make money. That's what they said. That's the question. So how do we deal with that? I know of law firms who will bring one interlocutory application after another, all useless in it, uh, when it comes to resolving the dispute, actually not, uh, doesn't help at all. All it did is that it generated fees, fees that they, they just kept billing and billing. Now, that those days are gone. I can't see that the public and the justice system is going to tolerate that anymore. This business of lawyers taking technical procedural points against each other, ending up in interlocutory applications and opposed motions, it's going to disappear. It's already starting to disappear. It cannot be tolerated anymore. What you have to do now is focus on the dispute, the needs of the client, and try and meet that need as soon as possible and at the lowest cost. Now, to answer the question, how do you make money? Well, uh, there's an interesting study. You can look it up. The Australians did a study of how it how case management, which was brought in to deal with this problem, following the Wolf Commission, um, impacted on the income of the law firms. What they found was that the lawyers who transformed their practices and finished the, and, and closed their files quickly were, were making more money than when they were running cases for three to six years. And that's a fact. If you keep a file alive for three years or for six years, what you don't realize is that it costs you money to keep it going. So what happens now is that you slowly milk the case for fees over 
three to six years. Now, logic tells you that that's not economically viable. It costs you more to do that. So we want to change this. But the focus, remember, is not on the lawyer now. The focus is on the client. Now, I will take through practical steps of actually showing you what to do in your practices. I can assure you these are, these are techniques and methods that have been tested and they work. Now, let's start with the Wolf Commission. In concluding the, uh, the uh, report, and by the way, the report is very comprehensive. Those of you who have an interest in it, you can actually Google it and it's available. It's, it's, it's a lengthy thing, but it, it's an eye opener. And I can assure you, it may have been done in England, but it is 100% um, relevant to us. Our systems are very much the same with the exception that we stopped using jury trials. He said, and this has become the world standard. Most countries using the common law system are using this as a standard, and this is the standard in this country. And you'll see as we go along how we get to this standard. Civil litigation must be avoided where possible. Uh, let's stop there. This business of issuing a summons straight away, uh, send the sheriff with a summons, um, it, it doesn't work. Why do you have to issue a summons? Many cases can be settled before you issue a summons. We know that the majority of cases that you send out to, the, to, the, to court and issue it out of court never go to trial. Maybe one in 20 or maybe one in 50 will actually go to a full-blown trial. Most of them are settled along the way or they somehow disappear into the ether, but they never get to trial. So why don't you try and settle the matter right there before you issue a summons? And I'll show you how to do that. And I will also show you that the, there's now legislation which will compel you as lawyers to do so. Less, you, it must be less adversarial and more cooperative. Now, this involves the change of mindset. As lawyers, we are colleagues, okay? There's no need for, up, for us to roll up our sleeves and want to donor the other side uh, just because client says you must go for them. Or you treat legislation as a purely adversarial process, which means that you must put up your fists and have a fight with the other side. That's not what we want anymore. We expect lawyers to cooperate with each other. You know, oddly enough, I've been in this business for 41 years. Oddly enough, it's not the clients that want to have the fight. The people who pick the fight are the lawyers. You need to stop it. Civil litigation must be less complex. Now, who makes it complex? We do. We are the culprits, okay? We prepare documentation our clients don't understand. We get involved in processes, interlocutories, and so on which don't advance the resolution of the case and clients just don't understand it. They're kept in the dark. It, it must be more certain with shorter timescales. <laughs> you know, clients, when they come to you, first consultation, they are very likely to ask you that question. Uh, how long will this take? And the lawyers, they will say, well, it depends, and they'll waffle on about the registrar's office and the court roles and all of that, and, and they don't answer the question. They just evade it. Well, it's got to stop. Lit uh, dispute resolution cannot take long. I mean, imagine if you had a problem, a serious problem, 
But now you have to wait three to six years for it to be resolved. So you have to live with this damn thing for six years. That's not right. It's not sustainable. And that's poor justice. It has to be more affordable. If you make it quicker, it will become more affordable. If you become more efficient, it will become more affordable, predictable, and proportionate. Predictability, I mean, litigation is entirely unpredictable the way we run it. Because although we have pleadings, we don't really know what the other side's case is. We end up in front of a judge who doesn't really come to grips with the issues. And then it's anyone's guess what the judge will do. And then we blame the judge when we lose. Um, I'll show you how to stop all that. And proportionate. Proportionality has become a benchmark, in, especially in the high court. What that means is you cannot litigate just because you can. The high court represents a scarce resource. It is there to meet the, the needs of the whole community. And your client and you as the attorney or advocate cannot abuse those processes. Ru take up time, take up space on the role, and run up costs. Uh, you know that when in this province at least, and in, in other provinces as well, Western Cape, KwaZulu, you, you have to certify, you get certified as trial ready. What that means is, when you come to court on the allocated date, you are ready to go into court and call your first witness. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you, you need a stand down. It doesn't mean you're going to negotiate a settlement now you are going to go to trial. Now, the problem is that every time you postpone a matter, you, you had occupied a space on the roll which could have been taken by another case which could have been resolved. Okay. That other case now has, may have to wait another six months to get onto the roll because you and your client put the matter on the roll, and you were never going to be ready for trial. So it gets postponed or it gets struck off the roll. So this is the standard. You have it in your notes. I'd like you to read it again. It is being followed throughout the common law world. So how did our courts respond to it? Uh, you can see that Case management was introduced in England in the 90s already. Um, we, we fell far behind, okay, um, to the point where judges became frustrated and the judges um, became more proactive and introduced case management through practice directives. Um, the whole the whole purpose behind case management is to manage the lawyers, not to manage the case, but to manage the lawyers. So two things happened. First, practice directives that regulate litigation. The whole idea is to shorten the time it takes, keep it relevant, and only use court processes for a genuine dispute between the parties. You don't, lit there's no more frivolous litigation allowed. You can't litigate because you can afford it or because you can, okay? And then we, we took a very long time to, do, to get this right. We introduced court annexed ADR, alternative dispute resolution. It's worked very effectively in other countries. About those of you who were, who, who are familiar with the Magistrates Court Act, the current one, you will see that court, uh, court annexed um, ADR was introduced there. In fact, the Law Society uh, trained a whole lot of attorneys countrywide to become mediators in, in the Magistrates Court, uh, and the, uh, the, the Law Society offered the Department of Justice 
panels of mediators who were ready and willing to assist. It never took off. And the reason being, they didn't have the funds to implement it. Now, the High Court took a more practical approach. And it is an approach that works and it can work. It's up to you. And that is the Rule 41A that was introduced. I will take you through Rule 41A step by step so that you will know what to do. As a law firm, your entire litigation strategy must be based on case management. You manage every every step or phase of the dispute from the point of taking instructions to final argument in court. The, the, whole, the whole object of case management is to finish the matter quickly and cheaply. Running cases for three to six years is not on. So, Let's look at some of the strategies that you must have in your firm. Your strategy must be based on case management. In other words, once you engage the other side in the dispute, you're acting for plaintiff or defendant, and you become engaged in, in litigation, you must have a strategy to conclude the case as quickly as possible. Now, I can assure you it is actually possible to conclude a case in the High Court here in Gauteng, 12 months. It can be done, even less. The judge president in this province, Judge Mlambo, he thinks that we should, we should aim for nine months. That's, some, some attorneys heard this and went, oh, yeah, they are, that'll be the day. But it, it can be done, and we've proved it. But you look at what's happening in England, in the European Union, in Canada, the United States, Australia, they introduce case management and the average time that they take for concluding a matter, that's from point of issuing papers to finality through settlement or judgment, they do it six to nine months. The matter is finished. I mean, that's brilliant. That's what we want. To, to, the best example I've seen is in Canada. They have such a fantastic control over the, the lawyers that matters get finished in three months. Any matter in the high court is finished in three months. Can you believe it? But they did it. You want to have a strategy to comply with all the time frames prescribed in the rules. Now, here's the thing. You, you should all be able to relate to this. Every rule, go and open your, the rules, even in the magistrate's court. Look at the rules in the SCA, Constitutional Court. Every high court, the rules and the directives come with a time frame. You must file within 14 days. You must serve within 15 days or 10 days. It gives you a time frame. Guess what? The lawyers ignore that time frame. They don't say, OK, defendant's lawyer gets the particulars of claim, enters an appearance to defend, and then works out the days and writes down a date that that's the day the plea is due. And the date is diarized so that the plea can be served on time. That doesn't happen. The lawyers file the plea when they feel like. Some of them don't bother to file a plea until they get a notice of bar, or even worse, an interlocutory application to compel. That's what happens. So discovery is ignored. Uh, expert witnesses, the notices, are filed out of time. Um, just think about it. Every time you bring an application for condemnation, what are you doing? 
you are actually asking for an indulgence because you didn't do your work. Well, of course, clients can get blamed as well from time to time, but mostly it's because the lawyers didn't do the work. So you must have a system in your office where you strictly comply with the time frames in the rules. Don't ignore the rules. You must commit to complying with the rules and directives that will help you to avoid delays and wasteful interlocutory applications. Now, when lawyers tell you delays happen because of the court system or the civil procedure, you can see that's not the case. The delays happen because the lawyers ignore the rules. Thirdly, you want to have a strategy to deal with any delays or failures to comply by your opponents. This must be done through case management and not through interlocutory applications. I'll give you an example. In this province, and I think it applies to all the high courts, you cannot bring an interlocutory application to compel anything until you wrote a letter to the other side, reminding them that they have to comply with their rule and putting, putting them on terms to comply. Failing which, you will bring an application to compel, and then the letter with proof of delivery will be uh, annexed to the founding affidavit. When we then, then what we did, especially in Gauteng, we started it here. We said that if you brought an urgent, uh, sorry, an interlocutory application without giving your opponent an opportunity to comply, we will give you an order, but we will uh, disallow your costs. Why did we do that? So that we avoid interlocutory applications. One of the, one of the um, 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 benefits that came from case management was that the unopposed role in the motion court just about disappeared. They vanished. Yeah, we still have a lot of interlocutory applications. I mean, we have a motion role in Gauteng, which has a segment in and uh, which is referred to a particular court for interlocutory applications. Um, so what, what does this mean? You will get opponents who will delay things. You know, one of the things we do as lawyers is client comes and says, look here, I need you to oppose this or defend this case. So you say, what's your defense? Do you have a defense? Ah, no, 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 just buy me some time. I'll pay it. Well, let me warn you that that is an abuse of process. You're not supposed to do that. What do you do now? If your client has no defense, you say to him that we're not going to abuse the processes. We're going to talk to the other side and settle the matter. We'll come up with a payment plan rather, rather than delay the matter through frivolous litigation over a period of two to three years. But let me sound a warning right here and now. And I've seen many cases recently over the last three years where this has happened where judges punished not just the litigant, but punished the lawyers for conducting litigation over a period of time, knowing that they had no merit at all. When you pursue non-meritorious cases, in the past we said, well, my Lord, those were my instructions, and, and your client got punished, and that was the end of it. We got away with it. Now it's not so easy. A judge will say, but hold on, you could see there's no defense here, or the defense you pleaded is nonsensical, or it's improbable, it's not plausible, there's no facts, nor law to support it. Um, you knew there was no merits, but as an officer of the court, you took it on, and you ran it for three years. You will pay the costs, and that's happened. They bonus proprius cost orders. Now, Let's, let's deal with the other elephant in the room. 
You've got an opponent who is messing you around. They don't respond. They don't answer the telephone, your telephone calls. They never respond to an email. You can't get them to file a document. What do you do? Now, we had a habit of being very, very uh, nice to each other. You know, we gave indulgences easily. Uh, someone uh, uh, doesn't plead. You begged them to file their plea. They don't respond. Then you send a notice of bar. Now, when you get an, when that guy gets a notice of bar, what does what does he do? Your opponent doesn't now quickly file the plea. Oh no, he, he rings you up. Firstly, he says to you, "Listen, but you sent me a notice of bar. Have I ever done that to you?" So now he makes you try to feel bad that you send a notice of bar. How terrible! Okay, he doesn't realize that he's been the problem. No, no, no. He puts the blame on you. And then he says, well, I'll file my plea. Give me two more weeks. And what do you think happens? You will say, ah, OK, have another two weeks. Well, two weeks comes and goes. Still hasn't filed a plea. OK, now you have to go to court to bring an, uh, to, to get an order that he's barred from filing a plea. Well, just before when the matter is set down, he comes around, he send, he gives you a plea. Then he brings an application for condemnation. And this nonsense goes on and on. My suggestion is you have to be polite and professional towards your colleagues. But if your colleague is quite clearly abusing the processes, then stop being the friendly uh, colleague and keep giving one concession after another. You need to just stick to the rules. OK, they didn't file a plea, serve a notice of bar. You're not giving them three weeks. Uh, the, the notice of bar says you, you serve your plea within three days. And that's it. OK, um, you can also use the, the excuse. I'm sorry, John, I'm, I can't give you an indulgence. Those are my instructions. So you can also blame the client. OK, but John, of course, is not buying it. You think, ah, you're, 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 you're a bit of a difficult colleague. I'll remember you next time. That's the attitude. Don't, don't bother. OK, do your job. Now, let's look at the outcomes that you expect. What, what, what do you want to get? Firstly, you want the pleadings to close within the prescribed time frame. OK. Um, You'll be surprised at how quickly the matter moves on if it if you actually comply with the time frame set in the rules. And then the next one, this is a big cause of delays. Eliminate poorly drafted or evasive pleadings. You know, I sat on the bench for many years and I can assure you, you can test it yourself. Go to the magistrate's court, pull out 10 files. Go to the high court, pull out 10 files. Read each one and ask yourself a question. What's this case about? Read the pleadings, particulars of claim and the plea, and ask yourself a simple question. What's this about? What's the issue? You will not be able to tell. You don't know. Why? Because the pleadings are vague. Plaintiff uses particulars of claim they copied from from a, from a precedent. And I've even seen lawyers use the wrong precedent. It's as bad as that. The plea, the plea is always a bare denial. OK, but guess what? What did we do? We tolerated it. We said, fine, so we got a bare denial. Now pleadings closed and you go into pre trial procedures, discovery, pre trial conference and so on. No one comes to a pretrial conference and says to the colleague, listen, your plea does not have a defense. It's a bare denial. It's contrary to Rule 22. I'm going to put that in the minutes. No, they don't do that. We'll go to trial, OK? Now, 
what we do now is that instead of messing around with opposed exceptions, now you can take exception. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong. Let's assume uh, particulars of claim don't disclose a cause of action. You have to take exception, but there's a better, a quicker way. You can firstly tell your, your colleague that there's something wrong with these particulars of claim. Will you please fix it? Now, you know, at the bar, at the Johannesburg bar, I know, we had this tradition, centuries old tradition, where back in the day, council had to sign particulars of claim. So you knew who was acting on the other side. So you get this thing and it doesn't show a cause of action or there's an essential averment that's missing. We, it was, we had a practice where you called the, uh, the, uh, the colleague on the other side and said, listen, John, I'm your opponent in this matter. I've got your particulars. Don't you think you should look at this? John will say, thank you. I'll come back to you. John will come back and say, listen, I've amended it. That's it, done. No opposed application, which is going to take another eight months to get to court. Okay. We have another method that you can use. And that is if the matter is a fairly um, high value or complex matter, ask for the appointment of a case manager. You write your letter of motivation to the deputy judge president and the judge will allocate you a, a judge. And instead of bringing an exception, you call for a case conference and on the agenda you put that the particulars don't disclose a cause of action or the plea doesn't disclose a defense. And the judge will deal with it in chambers. That works. Unfortunately, there are not many judges who, can, who know how to do this. There are a number of them who are really good, but I would say most of them need to be trained on how to do this. Um, but we'll get there. It is still quicker and cheaper than filing an exception. Um, you know, a simple phone call does the job mostly. You know, it will take a very stupid and arrogant colleague who will, when you phone him, say, now nah, there's nothing wrong with my particulars or my defense is fine. It's just a bare denial, but he'll tell you there's nothing wrong with it. If, and he might even invite you to take exception. Okay, well, in that case, you may have to take exception. Um, someone says, can you do this in the magistrate's court? I think you can. I'm not so sure. You know, I haven't practiced in the magistrate's court for a long time. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll find out and let you know. Oh, you can find out. You can go and speak to the good, uh, chief magistrate and say, look, can we do this here? Um, there, must be some, uh, there must be someone in the law society who can answer that question. Or the LPC. Now, the, this business of filing bare denials. Now, I think that whenever an attorney files a bare denial, that attorney is just playing for time. They are abusing the processes of the court. Write an email first to say your your plea discloses no cause of action, uh, no no defense. It is a bare denial. It is it offends Rule 22. I am inviting you to amend it. Failing which, the matter will be referred to the case manager, or you'll say we will take exception. Okay. Um, don't, the point is, you are not to tolerate it, okay? You know, if someone just files a bare denial, they are at a point where they have no facts with which to answer the plaintiff's claim. What that means is that defendant should not be defending this case, that defendant should be settling the matter, 
And that's where Rule 41A comes in, and we'll deal with it. After pleadings close, you want to seek admissions of fact that are not necessary to resolve the dispute and facts your opponent has no basis to continue to deny. Now, pleadings close, discovery is made. Your, your opponent now knows what your case is. They've seen your documentation. Unfortunately, in this country, we still don't have the procedure of swapping witness statements. That happens in England, it happens in Canada, I've seen it in the, in the US, in Australia, it works brilliantly. What happens there is that after pleadings close and you're preparing for trial, one of the pre-trial procedures is for you to swap witness statements. And you know, when you call the other side to give you their witnesses statements, if they don't have a defense, the game is up. What that does is it causes a settlement. Now, I can assure you that at some stage, we are going there. We're going to get you get the parties to swap witness statements. Okay. So, and that triggers a quick resolution. One, one of the things you have to do is between the lawyers on each side, you are expected to try and settle as many issues as possible outside of the courtroom. So that when you get to court, you are going to go to court with maybe only one issue. All the other issues have been sorted, okay? That's what case management is going to do to you. So what will happen is, when pleadings close, you'll be called to a case conference. Now that case conference can happen with the judge or you can call a case conference between yourself and, and your opponent. And there you'll try and obtain admissions and then try and agree on the issues. Now, one of the things we did in, in this country, uh, sorry, in this province, is that in the process of certifying you trial ready, the lawyers have to articulate by writing down separately from the plea what the triable issue is. You have to write it down. Now that, I can tell you, can present a problem if you did not conduct your case according to the strategy I'm going to show you, step by step. You also want to agree on documentary evidence. We can waste a lot of time proving documents in court. Documents should become an issue only if it is part of the dispute that needs to be resolved. In other words, the authenticity of that document is the issue. So what we require now is for the parties to get together and agree on the admissibility of documents. Now, those of you who have attended pre-trial conferences will know that that's always on the agenda. But we don't really deal with admission. We, we just say we agree on a bundle. And we might say, well, this document is going to be disputed. We'll put that into a separate bundle. Uh, the parties don't actually sit down and agree on the documents. The other big problem is we have a habit of discovering everything in the, in the office file. I mean, like everything. Useless letters, okay? All this correspondence. It's not necessary because they don't help the judge. What we want to do now is for you to to obtain and preserve all of the um, documents that you will require. Then you take those documents and only put into the bundle those documents that are relevant to the issue. 
all the rest is discarded. So you don't go to court and give the judge bundle A, which is 800 pages, and then you only use two pages through the trial. That's an abuse. If you do that now, you will pay the a price. What the judge will do now is look at your bundle and say, but we only use two pages here. Who's going to pay for all this? It's an abuse. Cost disallowed. That's what the judge will say. You have to agree on the admissibility of electronically produced documents. This can be time consuming in court. And you are to avoid um, having to prove electronic documents because it's not it's not like a, a hard copy where you produce an original with a signature and there we go. With electronic documents, there's no such thing as an original. The original is in the metadata. So now you have to discover the metadata. Then you have to look at in what form the documents were archived. Is it in its native form? Did they deconstruct it? Now you have to reconstruct it. It can be a lengthy, costly process. What do we do now? We apply the same principles of proportionality to discovery, and we say, only what you need, and try and agree that the, it is not necessary to discover and prove the metadata. Right there, you've cut, cut the time. Agreeing tribal issues is an important step. In this province, we compel you to do so. You have to do it in consultation with your opponent. You do it without referring to the pleadings and state separately and agree on each issue for trial. Now, if you conducted the case correctly, you should have your particulars of claim or the pleadings might, might bring up three different issues. But through careful management on your side, you may end up with one issue that is resolutive of the whole case. Then we have the other outcome you want, which is a big, big uh, costly thing, and that's experts. You must agree on expert evidence and the, the main objective with, evidence, with experts is to try and keep them out of court. You don't want them to testify. So what did we do? The judges are case managing experts. We, you know that in, in all of the high courts now, all, we, we started it in Johannesburg, and then it, it's used throughout the country now, where experts must meet and file a common minute in the absence of the attorneys. Once you have the attorneys in the meeting of experts, then nothing gets agreed, okay? Because you bring in, bring in an attorney, they will say everything is without prejudice and nothing gets agreed. So we throw the attorneys out and we say experts meet and file a common minute. In this province, if you didn't file a common minute, you don't get a date. And I think it's the same in the other provinces. So consult the, the directives regarding experts and actually comply. If you can avoid calling them, perfect. If you have to come call them, it must be on a narrow point. They shouldn't be in court for two or three days. The evidence should be done in an hour. Apply your mind to what the pra practice directives require to enable you to have your case certified trial ready. Now, not all our courts um, have the certification process. That's because they don't have an enormous role and it's quite easy to get a trial date um, in fact, the, the judges are very happy to hear trials because they don't have other things to do. So uh, they, they don't have a certification process. But in the busier courts, uh, that, that would be here in Gauteng, um, Durban and Cape Town 
there is a certification process. Um, and uh, you must comply with it. You know, there's nothing more frustrating than to get as far as getting a trial date and find that you didn't comply so that so the registrar tells you, sorry, you can't give you a date. Or you go to court on the day of the hearing, uh, especially in this province, where you get to roll call and they say, well, you didn't comply with something, we throw you off the roll. So you may have waited two years to get there, and now you get thrown off the roll. It means you have to wait another year to get back on it. I mean, that's terribly frustrating. It's not good for you. Um, someone just reminded me um, about what Richard Suskin said. He said that, that justice is not a, access to justice doesn't mean what we thought it meant. Access to justice means how we resolve disputes. It's not about access to courts and lawyers and all. It's how you resolve disputes. And that how is firmly in the hands of the lawyers. So in order to achieve all of these, uh, these goals, we've brought in court annexed mediation. Now, this is nothing new in other countries. Court annexed mediation uh, was established um, oh, two decades ago in, in countries like England and Canada, the US. Uh, how it works is that but let, let, let's, let's go back a bit. What's the ADR has been here in this country also for decades, but why didn't it work? The reason it didn't work is because ADR, whether you used ADR or not, depended on the parties and it depended on, depended on mutual assent. So both parties must agree, then you can go to use ADR. But if one of the parties says, no, I'll see you in court, I'm not interested, then you can't have ADR. So you see the whole thing fails. Um, many years ago, we had a commercial court, which by the way, we've revived again. But the reason the commercial court failed then was because of a provision that said, in order to refer a matter to the commercial court, both parties must agree. Well, the party who's messing around and kicking for touch, they will not agree. They want to go the ordinary route so it can take six years. Okay, it's an abuse. So now, so court annexed ADR works because the parties are not given a choice. If a judge can say, this point needs to go to a mediator. Where's the mediator? The mediator, mediators are available as part of the court system. The, the system, the, the justice department appoints mediators at a tariff and they are available uh, to deal with 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 the issues referred by the judge. So the mediators all have various skills. There are those skilled in family law. There are those skilled in engineering contracts, construction contracts, uh, tax. The, they're, 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 these are people who are skilled in certain disciplines and they undertake to serve on these panels. The trick is that when the judge says, yeah, at this point you can go to mediation, the parties can't say, no, I'm not. I want you to hear it. The judge will send you. Now I'll tell you where you need mediation. Absolutely need it. It's in all family matters. If you're in a practice that deals with family law, then this is for you. 
And I'll tell you, there's been a pilot project running in, in the Western Cape for some time now, where the there's a, I think they're an NGO, it's called, they're called FAMA or FAMSA, I'm not too sure. They have, um, they have social workers and lawyers working for them, and they mediate divorce cases, custody battles, the battles over maintenance, that sort of stuff. And they charge a reasonable tariff, very, in fact, a modest tariff. What happens there is that the judge in the Cape Pro, uh, High Court will see there's a dispute over, the, over custody. They'll say, no, hold on, I'm not hearing this. Send it off to, for mediation. And it works. It really works. At last, the, this province has moved to establish family courts. Those of you who keep up with the directives, you'll see that I think it's starting in July, the beginning of the coming term. Um, two, two judges sitting on a weekly basis in a family court, and they'll deal with all the, the Rule 43s and custody battles and, and all of that stuff. Um, so, We also know, uh, most of you may have been to a, a what we call a um, pre-trial conference, Rule 37 conference. On the agenda, settlement. Now, come on. Did we ever settle at a pre-trial conference? I'm a veteran of hundreds of pre-trial conferences. They never get settled at a pre-trial conference. We, we pay lip service. The minutes will read, the parties considered settlement. Parties unable to settle. That's it. Okay. Now, with court annex mediation, the judge can say, I'm sending you to a mediator where you are going to discuss settlement. They also, in some countries, have what is called a settlement conference where the parties must get together, have a conference about settling the matter. And it's not a case of getting together and saying, right, we can't settle, off we go. No, no, you have to minute what was discussed, why the parties are far apart, what is keeping them apart, um, what is the issue. That must be minuted. So it's a serious matter. Many, many cases get settled in these settlement conferences. So how did we deal with it? We dealt with it by bringing in 41A. This is fairly new, and practitioners are expected to cooperate, resolve disputes quickly and cheaply in the interests of the client. Our courts are already beginning to punish practitioners who are uncooperative, who, you know, go and read this judgment, Brownlee versus Brownlee. Um, with, 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 the, with the Brownlee case, it, it was a, one of our, the, the first judgments which, where attorneys were, were, were punished for the way they conducted the litigation. You can see from the name, it's a divorce. And this was one of those divorces that ran on and on. The file grew and it grew. The issues were still not settled. They got to trial. They got a judge. The judge they got was an experienced sook. And he looked at this file and he could see that the culprits here were the lawyers. They never attempted mediation. They never discussed the matter. They just fought each other. That's the firms. So what the judge did, he pointed this out to them and disallowed their costs and punished them with a cost order. So the courts are now encouraging you to cooperate with your opponent. One of the purposes of 41A is precisely that. And don't forget it. You will see how it works. With the Rule 37 conferences 
and practice directives, we, were, we keep compelling the practitioners to settle. It, it didn't have the desired effect, simply because South African lawyers are far too adversarial, okay? Everything is without prejudice. All our rights are reserved. Our rights are reserved in toto, they will say. I don't know what that means, but you'll see it in the letters. Well, you must change your mindset. You need to stop that. Those lawyers who were consistently and insist on being adversarial, non-cooperative, they have become dinosaurs and they're a dying breed, okay? You don't want to be one of those. Um, somehow they, it worked for them. They will, will manage to stay in practice. But the modern world, the 21st century, will not tolerate it. For example, already in this, in this province, and I know this happens in, in KwaZulu and the Western Cape, if you went to court day one of the trial, you are allocated a judge. You walk into court and you say to the judge, my lord, the parties have settled. Here's, an, uh, here's a draft order. Would your lordship make this an order of court? Or here's an agreement. Make this an order of court. That is what we call a door settlement. Yes, in the past, the judge said, oh, very well. Well done. Bring me, or bring me the, the, the agreement signs it, stamps it, order of court, everyone goes on very happy. Well, now we've caught up with this. What, did, what happened? They had a pretrial conference five weeks before. They didn't settle at the pretrial conference. So what happened between the pretrial conference and the, and the doors of the court that they all, all of a sudden settled? Door settlements are now seen for the scam that it is. What the lawyers were doing, if they settle in the pretrial conference, it means they can't charge preparation fees and they can't charge a trial fee for the first day. So the judges are now saying, well, if you settled at the door and you can't give us a rational reason why you couldn't settle it before coming to the door, we will disallow your costs for preparation and we'll disallow you a trial fee. Oh, we'll make it an order of court, but you won't get your fees. So that's what's happening. So the game is up. You have to apply your mind to it and be able to provide evidence that you did. Now, here's the thing. When you tell lawyers, go and comply with this rule, they find a way to merely comply. Uh, so, what happens is the parties, um, they write to each other or they make a minute that there was compliance, but actually they didn't, they didn't com actually comply. They merely complied. Rule 41A is designed in such a way that you are forced to actually comply. You must show that you applied your mind to the settlement, whether it's to settle a point of issue or the matter itself. Now, the real culprits are not the clients. It is the adversarial practitioner who, when you challenge the, the lawyer to say, listen, you could have settled it earlier. The lawyer will throw up his hands and say, those were my instructions. And yet, if you call the client in and found out what the instructions were, you'd see that there were no such instructions. Now, 41A defines dispute as the subject matter of litigation between parties or an aspect thereof. Do you see it's a very wide definition and can encompass any dispute subject to litigation? So it covers motion court as well. However, there are certain disputes where judges will firmly focus on compliance with this rule, and that is family matters. You see, um, modern courts throughout the world 
have adopted the view that family matters should not be subject to an adversarial dispute in an open court. It's just wrong. And our courts, after many years, have realized just how wrong it is. And we are stopping it. If you take England, the European Union, Canada, um, or even Australia, they don't hear family matters in a normal court. Those things are always sent to mediation. Go and fix it. Or you have a family court where the matter is dealt with sensitively and quickly. You cannot have family matters running for two years and three years. I've seen divorces that have been dragged on for up to six years. I mean, that's ridiculous. Now, the, I'm just reminding you that we now have family advocates, the family courts here. Um, and those of you who are in family law, please go and see how this thing works. The, the directives have been published already. Okay. Now, what's the purpose of 41A? The first prize is to settle the whole dispute through mediation or discussion. Here's the thing. When someone comes to, say, to you and say, issue a summons here, you get the facts first. You don't, you don't issue the summons, then talk mediation. You get the facts first. Uh, and then say, well, it looks like there's, there could be scope to
I'm on. Okay. Yes. What is this blue thing on my screen? Oh, okay. So. Did you want me to call Grace? No, 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 no. You know, there's a little blue square in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, I have no idea. But can you see me then? Am I, I visible? You. Eh? You, are, you are visible. You are visible. Okay, and, and how's the, the presentation? You, we don't see the presentation. You're not seeing the presentation? No. Oh, no, no, I'll tell you why. I didn't share it. There you go. Is the presentation on screen? Yes. OK. All right. We'll start as soon as. Uh... I, I okay. asked for a 10 minute break, and yeah. that was um, okay. around about 11 minutes past 12. OK. Um, Betty, it looks like most people are back on again. Am I right? I didn't get that, George. Are most people on again? Yes. OK, we'll we'll well, we'll start in another five minutes then.
<clears throat> okay, I'm going to start. If someone's not hearing me or can't see the presentation, just indicate, please. I think Betty is off because the law school is load shedded. And I'm, I'm back, sir. Back. We can't see you. We can't hey? see you. We can't oh, see you. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Yes. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay. Can I carry on? Yes, please. Okay. Right. Um, Oh, we, we have to live with this. Uh, I wonder if any of you have been in the high court in Joburg or Pretoria when the lights go out. It's it's ridiculous. It's pitch dark because there's no windows or anything. And it's it's uh, thank heavens for cell phones. You see everyone pulling out cell phones and putting on the torch. So it's quite funny. Um, OK, Let, let's let's continue with rule 41. A two. Now you'll see this this rule builds builds up uh, towards achieving the object of getting the parties to genuinely attempt settlement. Now, if that is the object of the rule, why resist it? Why shouldn't you take part in settlement talks in mediation? Okay. So the rule says every new action or application proceedings, 41A applies. So what that means is whether you, you are required to send a notice to the other side, whether you're a plaintiff, defendant, applicant, or respondent, calling on them to indicate in writing. Now, this is the important bit. It must be, they must respond in writing. There's none of this business of, nah, we're not interested, you know. Whether such party agrees to or opposes referral to the dispute to mediation. Uh, now, when they say respond in writing, it's not enough for you to say, for the other side to say, no, we don't agree. Full stop. They have to say why. It, it, you are expected to say why. The notice must be in accordance with Form 27 of the first schedule. So you've got a form. I suggest you have an electronic version on your system so you can just uh, copy and use it. Now, you are expected to, to say, according to the rules, the rule says clearly and concisely indicate the reasons for believing that the dispute is or is not capable of being mediated. Subrule 2C requires the parties to apply their minds to do this. So I'm giving you a warning. Do not prepare a generic precedent from which you will copy and paste your response. Judges will see through it and there will be consequences. Now, why, have I, why am I saying this? Experience has taught us that when attorneys and advocates are expected to comply to a procedural requirement, what they do is that they go and create precedents, standard responses, like we had with pretrial conferences. Um, we had a standard um, uh, agenda, which we copied and pasted, and the responses were equally standard responses. It was mostly yes or no, and it served no purpose. So don't do it here. If your if the other side does not comply with two with the, with this two um, uh, C subrule two C, you'll have to write to them and say, look, you haven't complied with this with the requirement, and this is the letters or the emails will will result in a in a record of conduct between the parties 
Do you see why it needs to be in writing? We recommend that when you take instructions to commence litigation, at the same time, and I say only do this once you have all the facts, take instructions on the possibility of settlement, the possibility of mediation. Now, when you take instructions, this must become part of the process of taking instructions. So there are formal requirements that attorneys and, and the Section 34 advocates have to do, and things like man, written mandates and uh, FICA compliance and all of that stuff. Then you get to the merits. Here you have to take instructions on the possibility of settlement. If you're acting for the defendant and you decide you, it's not possible uh, to mediate or even uh, as the plaintiff, you will have to ask for reasons. And then your client must be able to give, articulate some reasons. This is indeed what the rule was intended to do. In fact, there is also the possibility that you could settle the dispute without launching proceedings. Now, that's, that's, that's actually a very good thing to do. Um, why did we, why did it, why, why has it been found that lawyers who close their files quickly make more money? It's because they get a reputation for resolving matters quickly and more people walking through the door. And you know the best thing you can do with the matter is resolve it, close the file, and have the money in the bank. Okay, all the money that's owed to you. This business of stretching it for three to six years and getting uh, paid from time to time small amounts is not economically viable. You must close the file, bank the money. That works. Now, the one thing that we know will get into the way of settlement uh, negotiations or settlement conferences or mediation even uh, is the question of giving the is, is the is the issue of giving the game away so the rule provides that notices will not be filed with the registrar and they are regarded as without prejudice now we are teaching advocates and attorneys that it is within the rules of ethics that you may not disclose details of settlement uh, negotiations that will prejudice your client or the other side. They are without prejudice negotiations and you dare not disclose it to win an advantage. That is a breach of ethics. 41A3 facilitates for mediation process to be introduced or used at any other stage of litigation. At, in other words, at any stage before judgment, the parties can agree to refer the matter or even a single issue to mediation. Now, if your, case, if your matter is under case management, it's not only the parties um, that will request mediation in terms of 41A3. A judge might refer you to mediation, okay? If the matter is already before a judge, then you need to obtain leave of the court. So you could actually uh, get a trial judge, and on the morning of the hearing, you've made your opening statement, and you call your first witness. Thereafter, you might see that you are you may be able to to actually um, mediate a point. You can tell the judge, and the judge will give you um, leave to do so. This rule also entitles a judge or a case manager at any stage before judgment to refer the matter. 
But it is still up to the parties to agree to refer the matter to mediation. So here you have an option. If the judge says, don't you think you should take this to mediation? And the parties have good reasons to disagree, then that ends the matter. The judge must deal with it. Now, here's some practical suggestions. You don't see this in the rule book. When you and your opponent agree to mediation, it is absolutely essential for both the parties to carefully consider the issue being referred. Now, you cannot bring in a mediator if you haven't, if you don't know what the issue is. I mean, that's ridiculous. There must be a shared understanding of the scope of the mediation. So you must define the issue for the mediator. You must write it down. You must agree on it. You can also seek the guidance of the judge where the matter has already commenced and you have to seek leave for a referral, that would be a good time to settle or define the issue with input from the judge or case manager if the matter hasn't started um, before a judge. So you can see that as you read this rule, the subparagraphs, um, that they've thought they thought this through very carefully and allowed you opportunities to settle at just about every phase of the of the process. Then there's the important question of choice of mediator. Now, <laughs> this is very important. You get this wrong, you're gonna get into trouble, okay? Firstly, the parties must have joint approval of who will be appointed. Now, currently, this in, in our courts, we do not have um, we do not have uh, panels of mediators in the high court. We don't have. We have in the magistrates court, but it's not activated yet. When it'll be activated, who knows? Where the, the the Department of Justice says they don't have the funds to activate that. Um, well. In the High Court, we haven't got there yet, but I, I'm sure that as time goes by, we will adopt the, the system used in, in other jurisdictions and we will have a panel. It's also a good idea for you to learn the skills and become members of that panel. Uh, by the way, to, I, I like giving um, advice. It is an imp it's now become even more important for you as lawyers to learn to be good mediators. OK. What I want you to do is go and find a book. It's called Getting to Yes. Y E S Getting to Yes. It's one of the best books on mediation I've read. I say it's compulsory for every lawyer to read that book. You can buy it on Amazon. There's a new edition now. It's it's written by Yuri and one other author. This book is actually a United Nations project, part of a UN project. And it it's a Harvard project. It was written by, uh, by uh, two Harvard pro professors, but they took up a quite a uh, a fresh approach to mediation. I actually tell you how to do it and how to get the results that you want. So write it down. It's called Getting to Yes. Um, and it's it's not a big textbook. It's 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 an easy read and you'll enjoy reading it. Uh, they what what the United Nations does is when they send in UN representatives into a conflict zone to mediate, they give them this book. OK, so can you imagine how brilliantly it will work? If you had to try and mediate a divorce, OK? Um, that's about as 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 conflicted as you will get in your practice. So the parties must have joint approval of who will be appointed. Avoid anyone who might harbor a perceived bias or possible conflict of interest that that you know already. There is a list of trained mediators with LSSA. This is the this is the um, panel that they put up for the law for the magistrates court 
They were trained by lead. Some of you may have done the training. The parties may even refer the choice to an independent and credible member of the profession. You could also seek the assistance of the LPC. Uh, I'm, I'm sure in time they will have a panel put put for your put up for for your convenience. It is also useful to consider the nature of the issue when selecting a mediator. It is recommended that you choose a mediator who has well established skills in the area of law applicable. Um, there's no point in finding someone to mediate a divorce who knows nothing about family law. Okay. Or getting someone to mediate a, a uh, engineering dispute who doesn't understand engineering disputes. Okay. Then we move on to sub four. The rule requires two things. The parties must present a join, joint signed minute of the agreement to refer. Prior to commencement of mediation, the parties must enter into an agreement to mediate. Now, what is required is a very simple agreement. You do not want it. It's quite informally done. It, it must have the essential, the bare essentials that the, that the parties are engaged in litigation in this matter. The parties have agreed that an an issue can be mediated, they've agreed to uh, appoint a mediator. And, they, and in that agreement, they can define the issue. What you don't want is to use the office precedent of an agreement and come up with a 200-page document which has 150 pages of boilerplate clauses, okay? Just don't do that. It dis the rule discourages rigid formality the parties are expected to sign an agreement to mediate. You may include a definition of the issue, as I said, or the scope of the mediation. You have to define the scope. Otherwise, you will have a confused mediator and it doesn't work. The rule requires for there to be a record. It demonstrates that the process has to be taken seriously. No frivolous referrals are to be tolerated. And more importantly, I can assure you, judges are alive to the fact that some practitioners might use this process to cause delay. And we know that's going to happen. So be careful. Um, this Everything is done in writing. There's a record. And if the judge even smells that you are trying to delay, uh, use, use this to delay, and there's a abuse of process, you are going to you are going to pick up a, a punitive cost order. There are also time frames provided from the date of signature of the agreement to mediate. All time frames for the filing of pleadings, affidavits, and so on will be suspended. Now, what? Let's say the parties plaintiff filed a particulars of claim, sent a notice in terms of of um, form 27, I think it is, and got a response that, yes, we are willing to mediate. We think that we could uh, get somewhere. The all, then the, all of the DAs or the timeframes that apply for further uh, procedural steps will be suspended. And it also provides for a party to approach the court to uplift the suspension of time frames where the other party is abusing the process to cause delay. You see, it's right there. They, uh, we, uh, lawyers are so predictable that you just know that this is a process, someone's going to abuse it. So we've put in the, uh, the checks and balances. You are given a 30-day time limit uh, from the... From the date of signing of the minutes, uh, agreeing to refer to mediation. It, this is another good reason to define the issues carefully and select a suitable mediator. You, you've got 30 days, so you, you can't have um, uh, arguments over what the issue is, and nor can you have disputes over who you're going to appoint. The rule provides 
on good cause shown for an extension of the 30 day uh, limit. Now, I say good lawyers will try and avoid an application for an extension, but just let me give you some practical advice. If you are already in front of a judge, you will not need to bring a formal application. Tell the judge, you, 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 the judge will give you permission to, to refer to a mediator, but tell the judge, you know, judge, if we need more time, if the 30 days is not enough, we'll approach you and, and ask for an extension. Most judges are going to say, when you get there, come and talk to me, I'll accommodate you. OK, but again, if the judge so much as as has a hint that there's delaying tactics being used, you will not get that right. 41A5 deals with multiple parties. Now, you know, in litigation, you could have multiple uh, uh, plaintiffs, multiple defendants. You can have multiple applicants and re multiple respondents. Now, what is easily predictable, as easily predictable as the, as the abuse that could happen, is that when you have multiple parties, you are not going to get uniform agreement. Someone's going to disagree. Someone will say, yes, we can go to mediation, and someone will say no. So in this event, what the rule provides is that one party cannot stop the mediation. That party can step aside and the mediation proceeds with those parties who want to mediate. What is important is the provision that a selected issue may be referred to mediation and the remaining issues may proceed to court. I've explained that to you already. If an issue referred to mediation remains unresolved, there's no prejudice to the parties. The judge will then have to deal with it in a hearing. OK. Some more advice. When you have multiple parties where some agree to mediation, others do not, can result in, in a chaotic situation, which can result in delays and costs. It is recommended that parties attend a case conference to discuss referral. Now, that facilitates things because what you don't want is to navigate between four or five different parties uh, running around between them. You haven't got time to write emails and so on. You convene a case conference. What's on the agenda? Rule 41A. The first prize is to get uniform agreement. If that is not possible, then agree on a plan to manage the process with one party having to file pleadings. Because remember, if the party decides they're not taking part in the mediation, then the DAs are not suspended. They keep running. So you make an arrangement for that party to file pleadings and the other parties go to mediation. This has to be minuted at this meeting or conference and must be available for the judge when you resume. Consider the effect of reading pleadings. You know, <laughs> this is just an example. The effect of reading pleadings from one party while mediating, uh, whilst mediation is happening between the others. So it can be really messy and issues may overlap. So I say, th take, take the sensible route. Call the parties to a conference and manage all of these issues. The, the idea is for you not to engage the judge in court and use up court time. However, here's another piece of practical advice. Let us assume you are unable to reach agreement or a sensible uh, process going forward in the in this conference, you still have the option of going to the judge. The judge may be a case manager, or if you are already in front of a judge, you can go to the judge and say, look, we've reached an impasse here. Can you assist us with it? 
You can even get a case manager to assist the parties where agreement cannot be reached. That applies to a judge as well. Sub six is an important provision as it is designed to encourage people to use mediation. So all communications, writ oral or written, documentation used in the mediation is confidential. In the event of continued lit litigation, it cannot be admitted into evidence. However, there has to be a record. I'll show you why. Because at the end of the matter, when the judge gives judgment, this record can then be produced for purposes of determining the costs. Okay. If there's a punitive cost order to be had, you need this information. Then it's not without prejudice. The sub rule seven enforces the time limit of 30 days. Once mediation is concluded, the parties are required to inform the registrar by filing a notice. Where the parties fail to file a notice, the suspended time period will lapse after 30 days. So there's a provision for an automatic lapsing of the time. So, the, so you can't just say, get a, get, agree to mediation and then go off and ignore all the time periods. Uh, because lawyers are great at ignoring time periods. Well, there'll be consequences here if you do ignore. Uh, here there is, with sub eight, further enforcement of the 30 day limit. There's a deeming provision where the 30 day limit is exceeded mediation will be deemed to be completed and the suspended uh, the suspended time periods will lapse, which means if 30 days goes by, um, the normal DAs kicks in and the time period that had lapsed will be activated again. So this serves a purpose. It is intended to assist litigants to resolve the dispute quickly at a reduced cost. So it's imperative that the process itself doesn't add to the delay and wasted costs. Now that's the point. The point of this, this subsection or the sub rule is that the whole idea behind 41A is to encourage the parties to settle issues or the whole matter quickly and cheaply. But you know what lawyers are like, they can take any procedure and turn it into a very expensive uh, um, uh, process, rich in delays and very rich in fees. We want to stop that, okay? Practitioners must accept that for the process to work, mediation must be completed within 30 days and preferably in less than 30 days. There's some matters that can be mediated. You've got, you, uh, you've got a day with the mediator and the mediator could resolve the matter on the same day. When it's complete, the parties, including the mediator, must issue a joint minute. And this is what is required. Where the mediation was successful, whether full or partial settlement was reached, the minute must also record where appropriate that mediation was unsuccessful. The issue upon which agreement was reached, that must be recorded and which do not require hearing by the court. Subrule D prohibits disclosure of offers and tenders made during the mediation. That, that is privileged information. It doesn't get to the judge. Then we deal with costs. The fees of a mediator will be borne equally by the parties unless the parties agree otherwise. When the court considers an order of costs when, in, uh, when concluding the action or application, the parties may refer the court to the notices in sub rule two and may draw the judge's attention to offers and tenders. Now I'll tell you why, what you need to look out for. If you go, go to rule 379A, there's a provision in that rule that says that if a practitioner 
did not take reasonable steps to resolve an issue or the matter, then that practitioner will be ordered to pay the costs. It's a punitive order directed at the lawyers. The same applies here. When the, the court is considering costs, and it's quite clear from the record that one of the lawyers had been behaving badly, not cooperating, being adversarial, not making concessions which he should make, uh, not helping to resolve the matter, that lawyer is going to get punished with a cost order. Now, as good lawyers, you will do two things. When you encounter a lawyer, a colleague, or a learned friend who is not cooperating, keep a comprehensive record of everything that happened. Then, during the process, as a good lawyer, you will tell your opponent, look here, you are not helping. And I'm, and I'm warning you, we will use Rule 379A. So please, can't we deal with the sensibly? Tell them. Don't be afraid to tell them. They can only refuse and get even more belligerent. That's fine. Then you'll make a record of that. That lawyer will pay the price. You know, I recently dealt with a matter where I was acting for one of the, the banks. And there was an attorney on the other side who refused to cooperate. He was just the worst. Letters were written, uh, they were ignored, phone calls were ignored. What, the, what we did then is we prepared a chronology document of all the things this attorney had done and not done, of all the unreasonable conduct. This was uh, uh, stated in a chronology document. And it was served on the attorney and served on a judge who was allocated as a case manager for the matter. That this, this matter, this happened in Pretoria. So the judge looked at this chronology document and realized what was going on. So the judge, uh, it was Judge Van der Merwe, who was the, he was the um, deputy uh, JP then. He wrote a letter to this attorney to say, you are invited to a case conference with me. Here's the date, here's the time, here's the venue. And then he said, this is the agenda. On the agenda, he wrote, you are, to, you are expected to address me on why you shouldn't be paying the costs. So <laughs> this letter went out. You can guess what the attorney did. He withdrew. He withdrew as attorney of record, thinking that he would now dodge this thing. Well, the judge was up to it. Judge wrote another letter to say, thank you very much for your notice of withdrawal. You still have to appear before me on this date, and you still have to explain why you shouldn't pay the costs. Well, that attorney picked up a hefty de bonus proprius cost order. Now, these are the things that you think about as a lawyer. So if you've got an impossible colleague, you can deal with it, okay? And this is how it happens. Now, some, some more practical advice. The fees to be charged by mediators has to be reasonable. Now, I'll tell you where we are lacking. You know, you know, if you if you go and uh, appoint a silk to mediate a matter where you don't really need a silk, and the silk charges you thirty thousand a day, it it just becomes ridiculous. Um, the whole idea is to keep the costs down. Now, where's the point in going to mediation if it's going to cost you thirty thousand a day? Um, that, that that's ridiculous. Choose a mediate, mediator who is appropriate for the scope of the matter. In other words, the, the appointment must not be disproportionate to the scope of the matter. And 
you must agree a reasonable fee with the mediator. Don't appoint. Only appoint when the fee is acceptable. If the fee is unacceptable, say thank you very much. We'll try a different mediator. And let, let me assure you, you will not struggle to find a good mediator at a reasonable price. There are many colleagues who know how to do this and they'll be willing to assist. We will ultimately, we will get a tariff being imposed. OK, so I've, I've, I've dealt with this whole idea of one of being able to settle or the desire to settle. Um, it is now very much a part of the system of this procedural system. You cannot avoid it. You have to comply with it. So make it part of your case management and your litigation strategy to settle. We'll come to the point where I deal with taking instructions. If you have a client who is belligerent, who wants to uh, go to court, then there are certain things you have to do. Before you take, before you decide what you want to do, you must get all the facts. If you see that your client is being unreasonable or that your client doesn't have a good case on the merits, but nevertheless wants to start a case, you get those people. Um, the other type of nuisance is the one who wants to sue on principle. They've got rubbish merits, but they want to sue on principle. Well, my advice to you is to, for twofold. First, get as big a deposit as you can get. Then the second thing you do, you try and debit it out of trust as fast as possible and then charge them another deposit because they're a bloody nuisance, those clients who refuse to settle or come to you with a non-meritorious case. Now, I'm going to do something very different, and I think it's necessary. I see a number of advocates who are attending this. It's their bread and butter to appear in court. Attorneys now have full right of appearance. They, in the past, when we had the split bar, attorneys had no right of appearance in court and only the advocates went to court. Now that has changed, it, we've deregulated it. For an attorney, if you are going to brief counsel in every matter, what it means is that, you, or if you, if you outsource to another attorney with, with the rights of appearance, you are going to reduce your fees. Basically, you're going to give two thirds of your fees away in the process of, of uh, outsourcing, either to an advocate or an attorney. If you, times are tough, you want to keep the fees in house. You do that by making your own appearances. And I'm assuming that's why all of you are attending this course. Otherwise, you are wasting your time. So one, when you go and make your own appearances and you do so successfully, you know what you're doing, your earnings are higher. Those advocates who, who have trust accounts will have the same problem. They will appear in court but at times may want to outsource to another advocate or an attorney with the right of appearance. If the matter is complex enough that you require assistance, uh, that's fine, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but those cases that you, can't, you can do on your own, you should do on your own. So I'm going to take you through the series of these webinars, I will show you technique. I will give you demonstrations, OK? But we have to, again, address the elephant in the room. 
and its appearance anxiety. I know. I mean, I'll give you an example. I was in a very big law firm when I started my articles. I was at, at Edward Nathan. It was then, as it still is today, the biggest law firm in the, in the country. There, in that law firm, if you took into account all the partners, no, only one, one, went to court. That time, the, the attorneys went, they had no right of appearance in the high court, but the one partner did his own appearances in the magistrate's court. Not one of the others did. Out of all the PAs they had, only one went to court. Now that attorneys can appear in the high court, um, many of them don't. They will not go near a court. Why is that? You see, appearing in court is, an, is a performance skill. You're going to get on your feet in a public place and you're going to talk. People don't do well talking in a public place or performing in a public place. So that creates a problem. But those of you who must appear in the high court, will often suffer from appearance anxiety or what we call stage fright. Now, let me say this up front. It's normal. It's normal. I know some of, some of the most experienced silks will still get, the, get a knot in the stomach before the case commences. Firstly, you must recognize that you do suffer from appearance anxiety. Some people get nervous at the very thought. I say it is part of courtroom technique to manage your own anxiety. I'm giving you some advice on how you do this. First of all, and this might sound funny, but take it from me. Please do this. Never go to court hungry. It is a stressful uh, situation appearing in court in a trial or an opposed motion or even in an unopposed motion. When you go to court hungry, it is difficult to control nervousness and it will show in the quality of your work. So to improve your performance, have a good breakfast before heading off to court, especially if and I call him impossible J is presiding. There are some judges who are just impossible and will, you know you're gonna get a hard time. So you get very nervous. Just have a good breakfast, that helps. But it is important to eat healthy. I'm not suggesting you stop at your favorite KFC on your way to court. But if you did, it's still better than appearing hungry. So, so, now, here are some other things that you can do. Good preparation. There is no substitute for this remedy. What aggravates the condition? What makes you even more nervous? You, you, know, you may not realize it, but if you didn't prepare well, you know, you can try and fool everyone else. You can't fool yourself. You know you didn't prepare. You are going to get nervous. It is impossible to convince yourself that you prepared when you know you didn't. You will get the knot in your stomach, okay? Thorough preparation does one thing for you that's so important. Apart from preparing you on the merits, it gives you confidence. And that's a very effective way to manage nervousness. You must be confident. You must, you must know that you can pull it off. Uh, you must go to court knowing that you can perform to the best of your ability and that you don't have to prove yourself to anyone else. You have to do the best for your client. Your task is to concentrate on persuading the judge to find in your favor. Focus on the strengths of your case. You prepared. You are more confident now. 
you will know the strengths of your case. You will also know the weaknesses in your case, but do not dwell on the weaknesses. Focus on the strengths of your case. That helps. And then there are what we call relaxation techniques. Now, it's very difficult for me to tell you what to do here because everyone is different. Find something that works for you. It can be breathing exercises. You know, breathing is fantastic. We take it for granted. If, you, if you're about to uh, start a trial, go and take a deep breath. Let it out slowly. Take another deep breath. You'll see it relaxes you. Um, I've seen colleagues, senior colleagues, uh, do some light exercises on the like running on the spot or they hop up and down. The uh, neck exercises are very popular, exercising your voice. Uh, they all have some method to help them relax. And, you know, a casual observer might think, well, this is quite eccentric or you have a, have a bit of a laugh. But it's not a laughing matter. It actually works. OK. And then this is part of confidence. You must be able to back yourself. OK, don't go to court thinking, oh, I'm going to lose. I can't do this. The judge is going to chew me up. My opponent is is aggressive. I, I don't like him. I don't know how to manage him. Now, don't think like that. Be confident in yourself and your case. Face the judge and your opponent with friendly confidence, not arrogance. OK, confidence doesn't mean arrogance. Confidence doesn't mean you must be vinchat, OK? Be polite, professional, and then the persuasion begins. And here's the best advice. The first advice is you must eat before you go to court. The best advice is you must maintain a healthy lifestyle. Being a litigator, appearing in court, is physically demanding. It is mentally demanding, but it can be physically demanding as well. Remember, you're carrying books, computers into court. Um, you are having to, to stand on your feet for long hours. You have to sit down and get up. You are talking while you're on your feet. It is consuming, physically consuming. And of course, if you're appearing in the Johannesburg High Court, the chances are the lifts won't work. So you have to carry everything up to the eighth floor using the steps. So I say being physically fit is part of good legal practice, okay? If you're not fit, you are going to suffer. It's simple as that, okay? So start gymming, eh? Those of you who are not gymming and just give, give up all the funny foods. Now, you can seek assistance as well. Therapy and professional interventions work. The idea is if, you, if, if anxiety becomes a problem, and I've seen it become a problem, I know of a counsel, a fairly experienced one, uh, who had a nervous breakdown in court. This, this poor advocate had to be carried off on a stretcher. Okay, it can happen. The reason it happened to that advocate is because she didn't recognize this as a problem and did nothing about it. Never suffer in silence. Nothing wrong with getting therapy for this. You need to be the best courtroom lawyer you can be. And finally, I want to deal with this. Uh, one of the one way to deal with anxiety is to recognize that you can off you often feel anxious when the judge starts engaging you. You know, when you get anxious, you, you come into court, you set yourself up, papers and so on, you tell the court orderly, call the judge. The judge walks in and everyone rises and then you sit down, clerk calls the matter. By the time all that happens, you'll find yourself relaxing. You're not so anxious anymore. But where the anxiety kicks in is when you're on your feet and the judge has a go at you. 
not actually has a go, but starts asking you questions. Or you're in the middle of argument and the judge starts interrupting you. Or you're in the middle of leading a witness, you get interrupted. So the interruption gets re really um, unnerving when the question the judge asks you is completely unrelated to the point you are making. So what do you do? Now, some of you may be familiar with this, with, with what we call mind mapping. It's where you, in your mind, you have established the main points that you are going to deal with. And around the main, those main points, you have other points. And in your mind, you can focus or you can actually visualize your main points. So when you get asked questions in court, if you have mapped out all your main points, you will be able to manage the anxiety and it will not be a problem. You'll be quite, you'll be quite good. If the judge asks a question, always answer it. If, if you don't answer it and you say to the judge, my Lord, I'll deal with it later or I'll come back to it. The judge makes an adverse inference. The, and please remember, when a judge asks a question, and even if you think it's irrelevant, answer it immediately. Uh, if you do not, the judge will think you are being evasive and the judge will make a note. You must watch the judges. When you say to the judge, I'll deal with that later, the judge writes a note. What he's writing is that it, that is a problem for you. Now, what helps? I will show you that with litigation, you start drafting heads of argument at an early stage. Not uh, the week before the hearing or when you apply for a date and you have to submit heads. No, you do that. You start writing heads at the point when you're issuing the pro process, whether it's summons or application. Your heads of argument work like a mind map. So you have a central theme called the case concept, and I'll deal with that in some detail in a moment, around which you deal with related issues. Now, when the judge asks you a question, what will relax you and the judge is if you can show that you anticipated that question and say, my Lord, that issue is dealt with in paragraph 14 on page 10 of my head. Go to it. The judge looks. The judge immediately settles down and listens to you. You will be on top of the question. Even if it was out of context, you will be on top of it. The judge will be impressed that you answered the question and you'll move on smartly. Having mapped out your main points in your heads, it becomes easier to manage the questions, even if it comes as a barrage. You know, Sometimes you have to appear before a full bench, two or three judges, or if you're in the SCA, five judges, or nine in the Constitutional Court. You get questions coming from all sides. And that can cause enormous anxiety. So what do you do? You have this mind map. Where does it come from? comes from your heads of argument. If you were poorly prepared, if you wrote rubbish heads of argument, your, your anxiety can turn into panic. And what happens when you panic is that a judge might bully you into sitting down. I've seen lawyers throw up their hands and say, as the court pleases, and they sit down. They lost the case. It's simple as that. OK. So what happens if the judge's question is not dealt with in your heads? What if you didn't anticipate it? Now, that can induce some panic. Simple. Listen to the question. Now work out how that impacts on your case concept. Your case concept 
is what happened according to your client's version of the facts. Does that out of the ordinary question support your client or is it against you? If it supports your case concept, then the judge is on your side. You're smiling. All you have to do is tell the judge that the judge is right. But now, tell the judge how brilliant the judge is with reference to the facts of the case. So the judge doesn't see you as merely pandering to him or her. Um, the judge will listen to you saying, you are right, my lord. Let me tell you why you're right. Now refer to the facts. If the judge is against you, you'll have to bring the judge around to your main points. Now tell the judge why your point is more persuasive. Again, good heads are absolutely invaluable. Okay. So the heads are the equivalent of the mind map. They highlight your important facts and points of law and maintain your case concept. Now, why do they help you in particular? It's because you're on your feet. You have to think on your feet. You are not going to read verbatim from those heads. You have to think quickly and creatively. Um, you know, you often hear lawyers say, ah, oh, that guy's good, he can think on his feet. Okay. Well, you can, you can do that if you wrote good heads. So you want, you, your, your heads will assist you in making connections between your points and the issues being raised by the judge. So what that means is when the judge asks you a question, what you want to do is answer, your answer must be relevant to that question. Don't give an answer which doesn't deal pertinently with that question, because then the judge will say to you, but you haven't answered my question. And that, that's bad. When a judge tells you, you haven't answered my question, that's very bad. It's not persuasive. The judge must also not get the impression that you are being evasive. So your answer must connect head on with the question that is being asked. Now, what I can tell you, this is the good news, is that as the years go by, you will learn to manage anxiety or stage fright. It never goes away. Look, there are some practitioners who somehow, they either manage it so well or it genuinely stops bothering them. They are the lucky ones. A good place to start is to be aware of it, that you do have anxiety, take steps to control it, okay? A simple thing like not turning up hungry, okay? And you know, <laughs> if you're appearing in the Joburg High Court, there's hardly anywhere to go and eat something anymore. You know, when I was uh, practicing at the bar in Pritchard Street, we had some of the country's finest restaurants all around us. And you could always find some way to, to have a snack or something. Now it's not so easy. Eh? Um, I also say to some of you may be diabetic, type 2 diabetes like me. You know that you cannot go to court without some snacks in your bag. And my recommendation is whether you're diabetic or not, take some healthy snacks in your bag, pack it there, and then go to court. It's a wonderful idea to have a snack during the tea break or have a snack at lunchtime. Okay. It's just, just me talking, uh, giving you some advice. Take it, you'll be okay. All right. Now let's move on to the matter itself. Where do we start? We say we take instructions. When you take instructions, client walks in, sits down, and starts telling you why they're there. You must already have a policy in your firm 
or if you're a single practitioner, you must have a personal policy that you want to resolve the dispute quickly and cheaply. You want to run your practice by the standards that Lord Wolf set that I pointed out to you when we started. Taking instructions, and forget about all the formalities, all the, all the LPC formalities. It means obtaining all the relevant facts and documents before you issue summons. Also remember, Rule 41A obliges you to attempt settlement at an early stage. Now, how on earth can you attempt settlement if you don't know the facts of the case? I mean, really, it's sheer negligence. And I'm going as high as negligence for you to attempt any kind of settlement or negotiation if you do not know the facts and the documents of your client's version. You will do your client a disservice. I say you are not competent to engage in settlement unless you have all the facts. So you can see um, that 41A has created a very good thing because I know from experience, the lawyers don't know all the facts. They issue a summons, the particulars came from a precedent, office precedent, or they copied badly from Angler. Um, they they uh, file particulars of claim that contain no reference to the peculiar facts of their case. Pleadings close. Then they go through the whole discovery um, process. Now, here's another thing. How stupid is it to, to, to engage in discovery, complying with Rule 35, if you don't know all the facts of the case? How on earth will you know that this document is relevant, that one is not, okay? How will you know, how will this document assist me to resolve the dispute? Will, how will this document be in my favor or does it undermine my case? How will you know that if you don't know all the facts? It is grossly irresponsible for you to engage in anything without knowing all the facts, and I'll deal with that in more detail in a moment. Do you know what the lawyers did? They get a trial date now, and they are told you've got a trial date. Oh, brilliant. Now they get a Rule 37 pre-trial done because they have to, and they attend it. They're two weeks away from trial, now they start looking for witnesses. They're now looking for evidence. They get an advice on evidence and so on. Guess what? Too late. That's too late. You cannot wait that long. Now, you can test it. Go and sit in the either Johannesburg or Pretoria where we have roll call. None of the other courts in the country have roll call. Um, I think Durban might have, but, or, or Cape Town. But here, the matters are placed on a roll, on a continuing roll. Now, in Joburg and Pretoria, we set down something like 120 to 140 trials a day, OK? Now, you must be thinking, people who don't know think, wow, how on earth can they deal with this? Well, the reason the registrar sets down so many matters is because we know that they're not going to proceed. Out of 120, if you get three that are going to trial, it's a busy day, okay? The rest of them struck off, postponed, postponed, settle, that sort of stuff. It goes on. Now, why do you think matters get postponed? It's because the lawyers are not ready. 
And one of the biggest causes of postponements is that when they get to trial, by then they've consulted witnesses, they've consulted their client, they've looked at documents, they know what the evidence is. And at that stage, they will realize, oops, my pleadings don't support the evidence, or rather the evidence does not support my pleadings. I've got the wrong cause of action. I have to amend. Now you need a postponement. Do you see how bad it is if you draft your papers without knowing all the facts? Now, we are now gone into a stage where we have judicial case management in our courts. So what does that mean? You know, if you take what happens in most of the uh, EU courts, in England, in Canada, what they do is this, pleadings close. In other words, particulars of claim, plea. Oh, by the way, in England, they don't have pleadings anymore because they say those documents are too technical and doesn't tell the judge what, what the case is about. And that's so true about our pleadings here. So there, they scrap pleadings. Plaintiff files, a statement of case supported by a certificate of truth, and the defendant files a statement of defense supported by a certificate of truth. So heaven help a litigant if they lied in that statement. So now a judge reading those statements knows what the case is about, and the lawyers are able to put their finger on the, on the issues. So, but what happens, let's say, it's the usual story. Particulars of claim and a plea. Please file, pleadings close. What they do is that they will then automatically refer the pleadings to a case manager who will then call the attorneys in and advocates where they they involved. Come to a meeting, you sit down, the case manager will look at your plea pleadings, they'll say, plaintiff, your particulars of claim are vague. I can't see what your cause of action is. Um, I'm going to give you five days to amend it. Or they will look at the plea and say to the defendant's lawyer, look here, this is a bare denial. Uh, you can't do that. I'm giving you five days to amend this thing. We'll arrange a date. We will meet on such and such a date to discuss your your pleadings. Now, what do you think happens in nine out of 10 of those meetings? Nine out of 10 times. When the attorneys walk out, they talk settlement because they can see the game is up. They both sides may have a problem or one of the sides will have a problem with the pleadings that they can't fix and they will settle it. Now, we, we're not doing that here yet, but the plans are there for that to happen, okay? Now, let's, let's go back to the, the question. How can you attend a case conference within a month of issuing summons if you don't know the facts? A judge will say to you, explain this. What are you gonna do? You're going to say, well, my Lord, I'll take instructions and revert. What a lot of nonsense the judges say, but you're the attorney. You've been dealing with this matter since when? And now you need to take instructions. Didn't you take instructions when you wrote these particulars? It's embarrassing. Clients come to you because they have a dispute and need your assistance. So what do you do as a lawyer? There's a question on the screen. It's the most famous question in dispute resolution. I call it the first question. You ask your client, what happened? Tell me what happened. That's where you start gathering the facts. Now, let's look at how you do this step by step. You, your first step, is to obtain all the known facts. 
documentation and visual evidence. The process is like this. First, you begin, begin by listening to your client's version of what happened. You must shut up. Don't try and show off your skills as a lawyer. Don't interrupt the client. Just listen and be interested in what your client is saying. If you have questions, write it down somewhere. Let the client finish telling you the whole story. Then you ask questions to bring out more facts. And by the way, please be alive to this. When you are uh, talking to your own client for the purpose of bringing out the facts, never ask leading questions. That, that is so dangerous because then you'll get a corrupted version. When a client hears a leading question from their own lawyer, they think that's the answer you want. They've got a different answer, but they'll think, oh, no, no, if I want a good result, then I must agree with the lawyer. And that's so dangerous. Never ask leading questions. Now, while you're listening to this version, this is what a good lawyer does. Ask if that version is plausible. In other words, is it probable? Can that have happened? Sometimes you'll hear a version, not sometimes, it happens all the time where clients and witnesses come and tell you a story and you think, ah, that's cock, man. I don't believe it. it th that's what you're thinking, okay? But you can't tell your client, hey, listen, you're talking nonsense now. You're a bloody liar. You can't do that. That's unprofessional. The way to deal with it is to say, listen, explain that to me because I don't think a judge will accept it because it, it sounds implausible. Okay, let's start again. That's how you deal with it. Now, when you've heard the version, now ask this question, what area of the law are we dealing with? Is it contract? Is it delict? Uh, is it um, a tax matter? Is it family law? It's what we call contextualizing the problem. So you're hearing the problem, you are already figuring out what area of the law, because remember the law is vast. You don't know everything and you cannot search for a cause of action everywhere. You need to narrow your research. So what area of the law? And as you're listening, think, will these facts sustain any discernible cause of action? OK, is there a cause of action here? Can I sue in contract? Can I sue in delict? Can I sue in terms of an engineering contract? OK. And what are the causes of action? Now, it, it's not as complex as you think. What is cause of action? Cause of action means those facts which the law recognizes as giving you a claim. Never forget that. What gives you a claim is not the law. It's the facts. What the law says is that if you can prove those facts, then the law says you're entitled to this remedy. So the definition again, it is the facts which the law recognizes as giving you a claim. That's what you search for. Now, why do you need to ask these questions? Because you are going to draft the particulars of claim. Or you may be drafting a founding affidavit or you'll be drafting a plea or an answering affidavit. When you've heard the version, now remember, it's early days, you're still taking instructions. You need to know why is client litigating? Why do you need to issue a summons? Can't we settle this without going to court? What is the motive? What does client want out, want out of litigation? Now, that's very important. Because if client wants relief that you know you can't get from a judge, then you have to stop immediately and say, ah, ah, listen, listen, we can't do that. The law doesn't permit it. No judge will give us that order. So let's rethink this. Um, why are you litigating? What, what remedy do you want? What does client want from the defendant? Now, the, from the defendant's side, it's easy. The defendant wants 
to defend the action. The defendant does not want to be saddled with the remedy that the plaintiff wants. So it's a bit more straightforward with the defendant, but it's not so clear with the plaintiffs. And then you have to ask the obvious question, and I, I must tell you, I call it obvious, but mo many attorneys never ask this question. They get into trouble later. Can the defendant satisfy a judgment? Now, for God's sake, why would you issue summons, spend thousands of rands worth on costs, issue 41A notices, go to case conference and all of that stuff, get a judgment and find that the defendant is a man of straw, can't satisfy the judgment. Now, you know, when you tell your client where... When you call your client in and say, Listen, look here, this is a nulla bona return. This defendant has got nothing. We, we can't get any, anything out of it for you. We've got a judgment of 1.2 million, but we're going to get nothing. Oh, by the way, you still have to pay the costs. Your client is going to look at you and say, but hold on, Mr. Lawyer. Why didn't you tell me that this was a risk when we started? Why are you telling me now, two years later, and many hundreds of rands later, you are telling me this now? I'm going to report you to the Law Society. That's what happens, okay? So be careful. We will deal with the merits risk in a moment. But before you get there, just check with client. Look here, Mr. Jones, if we sue Mr. Brown, will he satisfy the judgment? In this country, lawyers have an even bigger problem. If you sue government, it used to be taken for granted that you'll get paid if you succeed. Not here, because the government departments are insolvent. They're not going to pay you. Okay, So it's very important to check if the judgment can be satisfied at an early stage. Otherwise, you're wasting fees. Then you have to test it. Can your client provide sufficient admissible evidence to discharge the onus of proof? That is what we call a merits risk. In other words, does this version provide me with enough facts that will give this client a cause of action? And if, it is, and if they can prove that in court, they will get the remedy that they want. It's a very logical way of thinking. Now, go on to the next step. You sat down and you heard the whole thing. You applied your mind to what you were listening. Now you do some elbow work. You want to write the statement, the client's version down. You want to write, take a statement from client. Client must sign the statement. It doesn't have to be under oath, just sign it. Now, at this early stage, you're still taking instructions. There are very few lawyers out there who take statements from witnesses. They just listen to what the client is saying. They they fashion out a cause of action with a precedent, and they send out the summons. Now, you must have heard this phrase that lawyers use, bang out a summons, send the sheriff, must be there by two o'clock tomorrow. Those are bad lawyers. They are reckless. Take down witness statements now. I mean, can we be honest? How many of you took down witness statements during the uh, straight after the first consultation in preparation of issuing process? We don't do that. Well, now you have to do it. You must secure documentation. Now, I can tell you one of the most important things about a trial or an application, whether you for whichever party, doesn't matter. Documents are crucial, especially contemporaneous documents. Like you entered into a an agreement and you've got a and you signed a document. It's a contemporaneous document. 
you delivered goods to somebody, you received a signature on a delivery note. It's a contemporaneous document. Those documents are absolutely crucial. A surety ship agreement. Um, in the commercial world, you have contemporaneous documents being generated all the time. They are crucial to prove your case because judges, when they are faced with disputes of fact, they will rely on contemporaneous documentation. So it's crucial for you to, to source them, find them and preserve them now before you issue the summons. So, and I say, deal with electronic documents, very important. Um, documents now are actually not printed or typed and produced in hard copy. Every document actually resides in a hard drive where it was produced. So now you have to tell a client to give you access to the hard drive so that you can preserve the metadata and preserve the, the hard drive from interference, from, from being corrupted or changes being made on documentation. You know also that with electronic documents, you'll have to prove the document if your opponent uh, disputes it. You will need the metadata to prove that document. So get it now and, and copy the hard drive, put it in a safe location where no one can access it. Visual evidence. This is also absolutely brilliant. It works really well. What, what I'm talking about is what you know as exhibits. It's photographs, maps, diagrams, models uh, of, say, a bridge or a model of, a, of human anatomy, um, CCTV camera footage. Um, someone took a video with a cell phone. Uh, all of those things is what we call visual evidence. You will use it as an exhibit. Judges love it because it helps them to, re to resolve disputes of fact. Highly persuasive, get it. For your own purposes, write down all the material facts of your client's version and do so in a sequence. Now, this is, you take the statement now and, and, and to save yourself time, please do this. That is why I say listen first, write later. When you're writing the version, tell client, look, I'm going to write a statement down. This time, we're going to do it in a sequence from start to finish, step by step. They understand that. And that's the way you write your statement. Then what you do is you read through the statement. You've done two things now. You, you, you know that the version you got is probable. This is likely to have happened. It is not implausible. Number two, you already worked out what area of the law is involved. Is it a delictual claim? Is it contractual? Okay, so you've done that. What you want to do now is read through the wit your, your client statement, and you'll do the same with the witness statements, and write down maintaining the chronology only those facts that are material to your client's case, the most important facts. You leave out descriptions and um, what we call the facta probantia. That's, that's evidence that's required to prove the main facts. Just get the main facts. What we all lawyers call the facta probanda. Write it down. Okay. I'll tell you why that is so important. Firstly, it will focus your mind on the cause of action. You'll be alive to the fact that these are the facts that I need to prove in order to sustain my cause of action and get the remedy my client wants. 
So that's what you're going to do. When you do that, you are doing something else that is very important to you. That document where you wrote down the main facts in sequence, that will become the first draft of your particulars of claim. Or it will be, in, you will copy and paste that in your first draft of your, no, your founding affidavit or an answering affidavit, okay? So you realize that this is not for lazy people, eh? You'll have to do this. It's, it's work, but it's rewarding work. It's the correct way to do it. If you want to take shortcuts, you're going to get into trouble. And if you took shortcuts, here's the problem on the screen right now. Risk analysis. You cannot take on any court action without performing a risk analysis. Now, by now, you worked out that you cannot do a risk analysis if you don't have all the facts of your case, if you don't know the facts. So, what do the facts tell you? If there is an identifiable cause of action, now that's the first thing you have to establish. If these facts don't, give, don't support any cause of action, then just stop right there. You either need further instructions or you're going to tell your client, listen, but you don't have a case. I can't waste your fees. You will have to find another way of dealing with this problem. Um, we can't sue, in other words. So let's say you are satisfied there is a cause of action. These are the questions to ask. Firstly, what are the prospects of success? Can we win? Is this a winnable case? Number two, will the defendant satisfy the judgment if we won? Number three, what are the prospects of a settlement? Can we get a decent settlement out of this? If, if the answer is yes to the top, the first three questions, this is a case worth pursuing. And then the fourth one, how high is the risk of losing the case? Now, you cannot make this judgment if you don't know all the facts. And it's what this is what we call a risk analysis. Now, where does it become relevant to you as a practicing lawyer? Is contingency litigation. Now, contingency litigation is really, it's caught, caught on everywhere. You know, it's you can I can hardly think of a case where a client will walk in and you can say, give me a deposit. OK, mostly clients will say, look. I want you to sue for 10 million. You get paid. When I get paid, in other words, it's on a contingency. I'll pay you 25 percent of the judgment. We'll enter into a contingency agreement and that's how you will take the matter. What it means is that all the risks in the in the case suddenly got transferred to the lawyers. <laughs> that's what happened. The risk you will have to fund the litigation out of your own pocket and you can only recover it not only by winning the case but by collecting from the from the other side from the defendant. Now, if you, car, if, you, if you take it on contingency and you lose the case, or you end up with a defendant who is sequestrated, it's a terrible loss for the firm. All that money you invested is gone. You will never recover it. So when you commence litigation and client wants this done on a contingency, you have to carry out a very thorough risk analysis. You can't do that without all the facts. If the prospects of success or recovery is poor, then the firm is at risk. You can't take it on a contingency. If client insists that the matter must proceed, that's when you say, I'll take the case and I'll give it my best, but I will require a deposit. I cannot do this on a contingency. And you'll say why. 
Okay. So this has become very much a part of people's practices. Those of you who were in RAF practices in personal in doing personal injury work, you will know that those cases, I think these days 100 percent are done on a contingency basis. Okay. All right, now we get to the case concept. This is the next very important thing for you to do. Remember, you haven't issued a summons yet, okay? Now you're gonna deal with your case concept. In plain language, it is your client's version of what actually happened, okay? Now, why do you need to know this? Because it's your case concept. It's what guides you through the whole process from issuing a letter of demand all the way to final argument. If you cannot sustain a, call, a case concept through the whole process, it means that somewhere along the line, your client changed the version. And we all know as lawyers, when clients do that, you're on a slippery slope, you're going to lose, okay? This is the best definition I could find of case concept, and I like to, uh, to take you through it because it highlights everything I've been telling you. Theory of case. Now, case concept is also known as the theory of the case. It's the same thing. It is a logical, persuasive story of what really happened. Now, when we talk about logical and persuasive, we're not talking about truth. What we're talking about is, when we say logical and persuasive, we mean probable. And the, the standard of proof is on a balance of probabilities. If the, the story is lacking in probability, that is not a case concept you want to, to stick with. Jettison it immediately. It is your position and approach to all the undisputed and disputed evidence that you anticipate will be presented at the trial. Developing a theory of case is the process of integrating the undisputed facts with your version of the disputed facts to create a cohesive, logical position which eliminates the evidence in the most favorable light to your client. Now, let's, 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 let's deal with that. Um, what, what, what really happened? Now, in any dispute, when you deal with dispute resolution, what it means is that you want to get a set of facts. Then you split those facts, those facts that are in dispute and form the substance of the issue. And then you will have a framework of facts that will not be in dispute. They'll be the undisputed facts. When you, when you test your client's case concept, always ask two questions. One, is the version probable, likely to have happened? Number two, do the undisputed facts support my client's version? If it doesn't, then you've got a problem, okay? The position must remain consistent through each phase of the trial. That is, from drafting papers to final argument. Then at the end of the trial, the judge is faced with the question, what really happened? Your position must constitute the most plausible explanation. You see? It says the most plausible explanation. That is proof on a balance of probabilities. The judge might, must say, of these two versions, which is the most likely to have happened? Which, what, which version is supported by the undisputed facts? That is the version I'm going to accept. And now I'm going to find that that party discharged the onus. That's what it means. Now, I want you to go and read this again and digest it, and now you're going to practice it. Now, this is what you need to know. 
It is your client's version of the disputed facts. That's what this is. This is your explanation of the events, how the events are likely to have happened. Now, as lawyers, we will never know the truth. And in our system of litigation, the adversarial system, you are not expected to know the truth because your clients will not tell you the truth. Really, they do, but mostly they don't. In fact, clients typically give you facts which they believe will result in a positive outcome for them. It doesn't necessarily amount to the truth. But one thing lawyers can do, and this is what judges do, and this is why we have the onus of proof based on a balance of probabilities. The onus of proof is not based on truth. Uh, it, it, the onus of proof doesn't say he who tells the truth discharges the onus. No, because that, that's not possible. What judges and lawyers can do is listen to the facts and ask the simple question, two questions. Is this version probable? If it's not probable, don't test it anymore, throw it out. If you find it is probable, now ask yourself, do the undisputed facts support this version? If it doesn't, you've got a problem. Now you look at the other side's version and ask the same question. Okay. You, you cannot, as a legal practitioner, begin any form of litigation if you have not worked out the case concept. This is another way of saying, do not start if you don't know all the available facts. You know, I've seen this happen for decades, where lawyers sent out particulars of claim or sent out or drafted an affidavit. They actually didn't really know what was happening. They based their pleadings on precedents. That's not going to help you anymore. We got away with it as youngsters, but not anymore. You determine this before you begin an action or emotion. The concept, this is the concept that forms the basis of your pleadings and your affidavits. Now let's see what judicial case managers are doing. Firstly, they do not encourage dispute resolution in an adversarial approach. You are expected to cooperate with your opponent and resolve as many disputes as you can. Judges want to be able to read pleadings and be able to work out two to three things. Firstly, when judge reads the pleadings, the judge wants to see what is the plaintiff's version of what happened. Secondly, based on the facts of the plaintiff's version, what is the cause of action? Thirdly, based on the defendant's version, what is the defendant's answer or defense? So what the judge is looking for is a cause of action or a defense that is based on the peculiar facts of the plaintiff's version or the defendant's version. What the judge is not looking for are generic precedent-based pleadings. OK, now you're all familiar with these horrible police precedent based nonsense that that we use. Like accident cases. Motor vehicle collision. Every collision in this country happens in exactly the same way. Judge is reading the particulars. The judge will read. He failed to keep a proper lookout. He failed to apply his brakes timelessly or at all. He drove at a speed that was excessive in the circumstances. And the biggest piece of rubbish that you always read, he failed to avoid the collision when he could and should have done so. I mean, now, if you read that, oh, come on, you are lawyers, you read that. And I say to you, how did the accident happen? Can you tell? Of course not. You don't know. What actually happened is that the defendant's driver went through a red robot and caused the collision. Now, why on earth can't you plead that? Why do you have to turn that into he failed to keep a proper lookout? You know, it's just nonsense, man. It's, it's, like, it's like divorce proceedings. 
When a judge reads no love and affection, he doesn't know what that is. Nobody knows what that is. No love and affection. I mean, someone must define that for me. I mean, it's just nonsense. What happens is that she beats him up uh, uh, regularly with a rolling pin. That's what happens. So why can't you say that? How does assault turn into no love and affection? I really don't know. But it's the same with contract. You'll see that it's the same vague allegations. They'll say there was a breach without giving details of the breach, why it is a breach, what's the consequence of the breach, all based on the client's version. Okay. The judge will want to work out exactly what the issues are now. Uh, you learned in civil procedure one that the purpose of pleadings is to define the issues. Now, I told you, try it yourself. Go and read pleadings in the high court. And then ask yourself, what is the tribal issue? You won't answer that question. So now the case managers will say, define the issue. Tell me what's the issue. Now, if for some reason you escaped and got through the whole process, and now you ended up in court, when you rise to your feet in dealing with, in, in addressing the court, the judge, in opening statement, the judge will actually stop you and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Don't give me your opening statement. First, tell me what the issues are. What is this case about? I've seen that happen so many times. I've had to do it many times myself. The judges now don't tolerate it. If they can't work it out from the pleadings, they'll expect you to write it down in the minutes of a case conference, pre-trial conference, or, in, or a case conference with your opponent. It must be written down so the judge can read it without having to look at the pleadings, because the pleadings are not helpful. Judges do not encourage parties to bring unopposed and opposed interlocutory applications. Judges will deal with interlocutory disputes in a case conference, and parties are expected to settle disputes over process and procedure. You know, the one thing South African lawyers have become experts at, and by the way, the same thing happened with with lawyers elsewhere. They became absolute experts at taking technical points against each other. Nothing to do with the merits. The merits are about a construction dispute. Oh no, they'll have a dispute over your discovery affidavit is, is defective. Why? Because the commissioner of oaths didn't describe his, his uh, his official rank when he uh, said, uh, when he took the oath. You didn't comply with the government gazette. Now, tell me, how is that point relevant to a dispute around a construction contract? I mean, really? Now, all of you listening to me now, please take my advice. Do not be one of those lawyers. Don't look for a, a technical point to take. Deal with the substance of the issue. That's what your client pays you to do. Clients never pay the lawyer to take technical points with the other side. Now, if, you, if client is one of those time wasters, they will know that technical points is how you do it. So there you'll get those instructions. But remember these days, if you are one of those lawyers, you will be accused of abusing the processes of the court. And be careful. Judicial management will be directed to resolving as many disputes as possible, including disputes of fact. So when you attend a case conference with a judge, on the agenda will be a discussion over the issues between the parties and there'll be an attempt made to try and settle as many of them as possible. You must apply your mind to discovery at an early stage because the judge will only allow narrow discovery now. That's, that's, that's the way it's done. This business of 
four lever arch files of documents, forget it. It's a waste of costs. A judge at an early stage will expect you to articulate your version of the facts, whether you're for plaintiff or defendant. Then you must get ready to make admissions of fact. A judge will actively assist, assist the parties to confine and define the tribal issues. This is more likely to happen where the parties filed vague precedent-based pleadings. Now, here's the trick. Whether you have a case managing judge appointed or not, let's assume it's a matter that you started but there's no case manager yet, or you didn't appoint a case manager. It doesn't mean that you can't hold case conferences with your opponent. Write to your opponent and say, can we hold a case conference? This is what we want on the agenda. On the agenda will be the making of admissions of fact, which are not necessary for purposes of resolving the dispute. You will put that in the minutes. You will keep minutes and you will record your opponent's responses. Now, be careful. Res opponents, especially the time wasters, will, will always say, I'll take instructions and revert. I mean, you've seen this. It's so predictable. If you are seeking admissions, prepare a list of admissions send it two weeks before the meeting or the conference. That means that the attorney has got two weeks to take instructions. If they say, if they still say, we will revert, put a time on the revert, when, and the revert must be in writing. That way you will corner the time wasters. In a trial, Remember that the judge first has to make a finding of fact, unless there's no dispute of fact. Only then can the judge apply the law. You must be alive to what findings of fact you want the judge to make. Now, where does this come in? Where, where do you look? Go back to the, your witness statements, your, your, your client statement and the witness statements. Now look at that, the document you created where you wrote down only the material facts of your cause of action that tells you what you want the judge to find. Your job then is to help the judge to make that finding, okay? Um, how do you do that? You must prepare the evidence. The witnesses must be available, documents must be available, visual evidence must be available. And finally, what are judges looking for? Nowadays, in the past, you know, it was so easy to practice when I was a younger uh, attorney and advocate because we never punished each other. Judges never wanted to punish attorneys and advocates. They were, you know, we were all part of a nice big brotherhood. Um, and then the sisters came later. But we used to be a big brotherhood. And we didn't go for each other. So all the nonsense happened. We overlooked it. Clients got prejudiced. Who cares? And we moved on. The world has changed. Judges will punish litigants who do not cooperate. And that includes the lawyers. And I want you to go and read this rule, 37.9a. Go and read it. It's not a new rule. It's been there a long time. But what's new is that judges are now using it more and more to punish attorneys who don't cooperate. Now, there's a book that was written by, by, oh, forgot his name. It's a book called How Judges Decide Cases. And he said this, and it's so important, I wrote it down. A judge engages with real people and real conflict where invariably he is faced with a choice between opposing parties and has to do the best he can with the evidence available according to the burden and standard of proof. 
I've not come across a more brilliantly written <laughs> statement of what judges do. Now, you're the smart lawyer, so you need to look at this and say, how do I use this to advance my case? First of all, you can, a judge find it, finds it extremely difficult to decide a case where the parties prepared poorly and presented bad evidence or poor evidence. Now, remember, our judges are sitting in an adversarial court, not an inquisitorial court. We have inquisitorial courts here, but it's not what we use in daily uh, uh, dispute resolution or litigation. What? Um, so, if you want good quality judgments, you must provide good quality evidence. And that's what you must bear in mind. Then you're helping the judge. If you don't give the judge good evidence, the judge will not find in your favor, that your judge will find in favor of your opponent. The evidence that you present must show the judge that you satisfied the burden or standard of proof. Proof on a balance of probabilities. That's a perfectly good statement. Never forget it and plan your litigation accordingly. Your job is to assist the judge to find that your client discharged the burden of proof. The burden of proof is crucial. It is basically means he who alleges must prove, not he who denies. It means then that if you start an action or a motion, the burden of proof remains on you to prove your case. And the standard is on a balance of probabilities. Now, are we going to go to some basic fact analyses? This is what you do. First, write down sequentially the material facts of your client's version. Now, if you took my advice, you would have done this already. Contextualize the dispute. You must know what area of the law. Look at the general principles that are applicable. Now, you, the law is vast. You may come up, your client may come up with a dispute that involves an area that you're not familiar with. Your job is to go and listen to, sorry, your job is to go and read a basic recent textbook that tells you what the general principles are. But textbooks are very useful for one more thing. They refer you to the cases. Now, as a practicing lawyer, the law that you want is primary sources of law. In other words, case law and legislation. The textbook is there to help you get going. But what you want to present in court is the case law. And what you should do as a good lawyer at this stage already, read the latest cases on the subject. And what is the latest case? It's the most recent decision of the highest court on that subject. Don't go and start looking from pre-1947 and work your way down. You don't have time to do that. Academics have time to do that. You had time to do that at university. Now look at the legal principles that are applicable. Read the cases. Now ask, is there a discernible cause of action which can be sustained by the peculiar facts of my case? So now what are you doing? You've got the law. Now test by applying the law to the facts of your case. So you've got a list of the material facts that you wrote down. Ask the question, if I can prove those facts in court, what does the law say is my remedy? And if you have a remedy recognized in law, you have got a viable 
legally recognized cause of action. So what are the material facts? You need to look again. Can I prove them? And will they sustain the elements of the chosen cause of action? So what, what, what the law tells you is that to get that remedy, these are the material facts that you have to prove. It's what we refer to as the elements of the cause of action. All it means is those are the material facts that you need, okay? Like you see in a charge sheet, they, the prosecutor will write out what they call the elements of the charge. It's, it simply means these are the material facts we have to prove in order to get a conviction. It's the same thing. Will my facts sustain more than one cause of action? Now, this happens. You will have facts that will sustain, for example, a cause of action in contract as well as in delict. So what do you do? Do I plead them in the alternative? Okay, you need to apply your mind to that. And now we come to probable to what I consider to be the most important part of your um, of your preparation. You've asked all those questions. Now the main question is: Can I prove my client's case on a balance of probability? That's what you need to do. So how do you do that? Take each material fact that supports your cause of action and see if you can provide proof of those facts. In other words, proof to the satisfaction of the court. Do I have the witnesses? How will I prove it? Do I have the witnesses? Will I prove it by presenting documentation? Will I need affidavits? Can I use visual evidence? What have I got? Can each fact that makes up my material facts, that's the facta probanda, be proved by credible evidence? Very important. Do I have contemporary, contemporaneous documentation to support these facts? Okay. Now, if you've got all this, you are going to discharge the onus. But look at the version as a whole and ask the question, is this probable? Is it likely to have happened? Test each facet of your client's version by considering it within the general circumstances of the case and ask, is, is this plausible? Will a judge find that, yes, this, could, this, this is likely to have happened? If a judge is thinking, but this is bizarre, this, can't, this couldn't have happened, this is improbable, the judge will reject it immediately. Your client, and here's the bottom line, and it is in the bottom line, your client cannot make a case concept out of an improbable version. Well, you try it as a lawyer. Let Write down a statement that amounts to a load of rubbish, and now convert that into a cause of action. Well, you, you can't perform miracles, that's for sure. Okay. You can't make a silk's purse out of a sow's ear. You know that, that phrase. Well, if you get an improbable version and you try and make a cause of action out of it, that's what it amounts to. A good test is look at the undisputed facts or facts which you know your opponent is not likely to, uh, to dispute and ask if those facts support your client's version. If, are there any undisputed facts that do not support my client's version? If that is the case, now you're going to have questions about the probabilities of your version. Now, what I explained to you also, when I'm talking about the probabilities and testing it against the undisputed facts, that's very much part of the Plascon test. We'll deal with the Plascon test at another time. But now you, when you read the Plascon test, you'll get a, a better sense of what it means. It's basically resolving disputes with reference to the undisputed facts between the parties and then asking if those are the undisputed facts 
whose version is the more likely to have happened? So the ultimate, ultimate test is this. Is the version probable? If not, there's no prospect of success. Now, that, that, that goes without saying. You will never discharge the onus if the version is improbable. Check if you can present the relevant facts through credible and admissible evidence. There's no point in having a credible version, or rather a probable version, but you don't have any witnesses to prove it. Um, I mean, that's such a waste of time. If you fail this two-pronged test, that is probable and can be supported by credible witnesses, your prospect of discharging the onus is at best slim, if not entirely unlikely to succeed. That is, that is the ultimate test. And that test tells you how you prepare your case at every stage of, of the process. And now we come to documentation and visual evidence. You must find this at an early stage. And there's an obvious reason for this. You know, I've seen attorneys looking for witnesses three and four years after they took instructions, because now they're looking at a trial and they're thinking, oh, heavens, I'm going to have to now uh, pr prove these facts. Now they call client in and say, no, 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 we need to talk to the witnesses. Well, for God's sake, this is South Africa. People disappear all the time. Okay. So you need to find the witnesses before you issue the summons. Satisfy yourself that they, they can assist you in proving the facts that you need to rely on. And then keep a track on them. Tell client to check on the witnesses. See that they don't disappear. Have cell phone numbers, contact details, addresses. See that when you need them, you can find them and they'll come to court. The same with documents. Documents have a habit of disappearing. And if your opponent so much as smells that your documents have disappeared, they will make no admissions. They will say, prove it and you will have a problem on your hands. It's very easy to deal with an opponent when you say, this is my version, here's a contemporaneous document. How are you going to answer that? Okay, That opponent will be more likely to settle than to go to court. So this is a process that you have to follow. During consultation, remind client to mention any documents that may be involved. Now, good lawyer will have an understanding of commercial transactions, commercial practice, what happens when an incident takes place. You know, for example, that a receipt would have been issued, a delivery note would have been generated, a, per, a contract would have been signed. Clients don't know all these things. You will have to ask them that didn't you have a document? Didn't you sign this? I want to see them. Never review documents without first sequencing them. It's a very dangerous thing to get a box of documents or a file from client and you just read them. That's no good, okay? All documents these days will be produced on a computer. Tell client to give you access to the metadata because you need to check if these documents have been have been altered in some way. If they've been tampered with, you need to consult the metadata. Learn how to use metadata to prove your case. Um, visual evidence in the form of exhibits, maps and so on, I told you, must be obtained and, and preserved immediately. You know, it, it's really a stupid thing to try and do an in loco inspection four years after the incident happened. Now, I've seen that people, lawyers do that sort of thing. I mean, for God's sake, four years later, 
Never mind four years later, four months later, the thing has changed. So you go there and it's a completely new scene. What you need to prove your case is what happened on the day of the incident. Do in locos as soon as possible. Get your digital camera and, your, uh, and go out and take the pictures and make the videos. Never overlook the possibility of using visual evidence. You know, if ever you see an opportunity to use visual evidence, like a map or a photograph, a video, make sure you use it because judges find them to be seriously persuasive. Um, if you go to court, if you look at the, an American court or a British court, you will see the places full of monitors. Everyone has a monitor. Apart from the fact that they are uh, filing uh, pleadings electronically, which we are going to do in this province, comes in a new term. Um, if you didn't know that, please check the, the recent directive from the JP's office. Uh, so you need monitors for that. But before they file uh, electronic uh, pleadings, before they filed electronically, they used monitors to show videos and photographs and pictures. And remember, they used juries. Juries love it when you show them a picture or a movie or something. But trained lawyers, judges, find them extremely persuasive. Now, when, when you get to identifying the issue, now remember, this is done in three stages. Firstly, when you take instructions, you don't know exactly what the respondent or the defendant's response is. You don't know what the um, defense is. But if you, if you did your work and got a comprehensive set of the available facts, you can predict how the defendant will react. In fact, your client will tell you, this is what he's going to say, and he's wrong. He's lying. They'll tell you. When you've got the facts, the documents, the visual evidence, you have worked out your case concept, you selected the material facts that you want, you are satisfied your client's version is probable. You'll see here is a neat little checklist. You can use it to see if you've done all these things. Now, before you draft particulars of claim, Consider the scope of the dispute. What are the issues or potential issues between the parties? And do this in consultation with client. If you say, well, it looks like these are the issues between the parties. First, check it with client. It's their case. They might show you that you are misdirected. Always be alert. Is at an early stage of potential disputes that that you can prepare and confront them. Potential disputes you will see only if you did a proper fact analysis. Now, it is part of civil procedure that you and your client apply your minds to the possibility of settlement at every stage. Door settlements we don't allow anymore. You, your practice must be geared uh, your, 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 to comply with practice directives, you must actually comply, not merely comply. Don't be, don't just fill in forms. Now, I'm going to quickly take you through the outcomes that we're looking for in case management and what we expect from the practitioners. Pleadings must close on time. Delays, extensions, and indulgences must be avoided. We've dealt with this. Pleadings must not be copy and paste from precedents. You must plead the facts of your case. You know, it's so ridiculous in this country. I've seen lawyers use the wrong precedent. I'm not kidding you. I recently saw particulars of claim in the high court in Amtata. And don't tell me it only happens in Amtata. It, it doesn't. It happens everywhere. The attorney sued the local hospital in a me medical negligence claim. 
So you can see plaintiff and the defendant is the MEC for health and the local hospital. So you know immediately this is medical negligence and you read on. When I got to paragraph four, it read, and the cause of, of the negligence was the driving off. And I thought, driving? I thought, this is bizarre. I thought maybe the patient was run over by an ambulance in the hospital or something. So I read on, and then I realized what happened. The attorney used an RAF claim, a particulars, as a precedent, and he tried to morph it into a medical negligence claim. <laughs> and, and so the word driving appears there. I mean, this is so ridiculous. We reported this attorney to the Law Society, okay, and got him to attend a course on writing. Um, so the next thing we expect you to do is not to tolerate vague pleadings. Call on your opponent to amend. Avoid interlocutories if you can. In complex matters, apply to appoint a judicial case manager at an early stage. Now, once we've developed our case management uh, regime here, which we're still working on, we'll do what the other countries are doing. Case managers are appointed at an early stage and they take over the management of the matter from the point when summons are issued. Uh, it helps to resolve interlocutory disputes and it's quite it's it, it it comes as no surprise that well managed cases get settled they get settled very quickly if you have a complex high value commercial matter which you can't settle then please apply to have it referred to the commercial court now we do have a commercial well we had a commercial court years ago it didn't work, again, because the parties had to both agree before you could send it there. So, so the, the one who is not interested in, in anything other than time wasting uh, disagreed. We've now got a commercial court, both Johannesburg, Pretoria. I've, I have been involved in cases in that court. It works very well. The judges there are more experienced. They are experienced commercial lawyers. They know what to do and they get the matter resolved very quickly. I seriously recommend that you should go there. Discovery must be, must be made timelessly and discover only those documents that are necessary. Experts must comply with directives. If you don't comply with directives, you waste time. And the first prize is to try and avoid calling the expert to testify. But if that's not possible, then the second prize is to have them lead evidence only on a selected issue or topic. And when you are ready to proceed, you issued your summons, you got, a partic you got particulars of claim. Call your first case conference. Now you can do this two ways. You can call it in front of a judge, or uh, that's the case managing judge, the judicial case manager, or you can call the conference between yourself and your opponent. Um, now, what I recommend to practitioners is that you always first call a conference with your opponent, without a judge. You have a proper agenda, which we will talk about in a moment. And if you can't reach, try and reach agreement on as many aspects as you can. Have a minute. When you, where, where you reach a, an impasse where you can't agree on something. Only then do you have a conference with the judicial case manager so that you go to the judicial case manager and say, look, judge, we've settled all these things. We need you to assist us with this one issue and there'll be a discussion about it. 
The purpose of the conference is to agree on a tribal issue. The first case conference may be a bit early to do that, but there's no harm in raising it so that the parties know that at the next case conference, after discovery is made and so on, you will have to write down what you consider to be the tribal issues. Be prepared to agree on the scope of the documents. Now, if discovery hasn't been made yet, then put it on record that we, the two parties, are only going to discover documents that are strictly necessary um, to prove or, or relevant, strictly relevant to the issues. It's what we call narrow discovery. Reach agreement on how you will deal with experts. Now, experts, that the, you don't have much choice. We have very clear directives about it, and you have to comply. Agree to comply as soon as possible with all trial certification requirements. If your opponent is not complying, I told you what the answer is. You, you put him on terms in an email, then you refer the matter to the case manager. And, they, and, and you must also, uh, don't be afraid to remind this, this person that there's this thing called Rule 37.9a. And then discuss settlement. You're supposed to discuss settlement. I dealt with admissions, uh, how to seek admissions. You can read it here again. Um, if your opponent refuses to make admissions, there's a remedy for that. We discussed it. And remember, don't get bogged down in collateral issues. Just focus on the substance of the dispute and keep yourself and your opponent relevant to that issue. Nothing else. And here's a warning. You are expected to keep client informed of the costs incurred and of future costs and all risks of adverse cost orders. Where does this come from? You'll see it in the rules and regulations of the LPC. You will also see it in the Consumer Protection Act. 